Good evening. I'd like to call the Tuesday, September 25th, 2018 City of Gardner Planning Commission meeting to order. If you could all rise and say the Pledge of Allegiance with me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Start with roll call. Starting on my right. Loden here. Simmons Lee here. Brady here. Austin here. McClear here. Garden Hire here. Quorum is present. All matters listed within the consent agenda have been distributed to each member of the Planning Commission for study. These items are considered to be routine and will be at <coughs> will be enacted upon by one motion with no separate discussion. If separate discussion is desired on any item, either from the Planning Commission or from the floor, that item may be removed from the consent agenda and placed on the regular agenda. Is there any item any member of the Planning Commission wishes to remove from the consent agenda? Is there any item anybody from the floor wishes to remove? Hearing none, I would entertain a motion so moved the second since agenda i have a motion by mcnair and a second by Bowden that could mission the consent agenda be approved all in favor please indicate by saying aye aye, aye. Any, excuse me any opposed motion passes unanimously <coughs> Regular agenda item number one, Main Street Marketplace. Generally located in the block bound by East Lincoln, North Moonlight, and East Main Street. Uh, PP-18-04, consider a preliminary plat for Main Street Marketplace, a six lot, 17.31 acre commercial development. <coughs> have a staff presentation this evening. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the Planning Commission. My name is Michelle Craig, I'm a planner at the City of Gardner. And this evening I'm presenting um, three items on the agenda. It's going to be a preliminary plat and a final plat for Main Street Marketplace, and then we'll be um, presenting a site plan for Price Chopper. Um, I'm going to break this down just to let you know. We're going to talk about the preliminary plat and final plat first, since that talks about a larger area and the same um, area of the development. And then I'll um, I'll step away, allow for discussion for Planning Commission, and then come back and talk about the site plan. So just kind of setting up what we're going to discuss this evening. As I just said, we're going to do a preliminary plot and final plot for Main Street Market. Um, currently located within the Moonlight Plaza development, um, located at the northwest corner of US 56 Highway, also known as East Main Street and Moonlight Road. Um, and then we'll also be talking about a site plan for Price Chopper at the west end of that development. Um, currently, the entire development is zoned C2, which is the general business district. So first, we'll talk about item 1A and 1B on the, um, on the agenda tonight, which is the Main Street Market Place, preliminary plat, which is PP-18-04, and the final plat, FP-18-06. So the applicant is requesting approval of a preliminary plat and a final plat for Main Street Marketplace, uh, which is six lots on a total of 19.047 acres um, within the development. Um, the development has multiple ownership uh, patterns and it is currently surrounded um, by a combination of single family residential, multifamily residential, and commercial. Um, the request tonight does exclude um, certain lots um, adjacent to Moonlight Road and US 56 Highway. Um, and a majority of the development is currently platted. So here is a uh, um, aerial of the development and all the lots subject to the preliminary and the final plat is going to be outlined in red. So you'll see over along Moonlight we've got um, a vacant parcel 
and the bank is excluded from this request and then along Main Street we've got um, Walgreens and um, Quick Trip. Quick Trip is actually two lots because there's two separate land ownerships. Um, so if there's a little confusion in the staff report, that would be why, but it is one overall um, business. The plat um, shows new access easements, utility easements, and right-of-way dedication and adjusted lot lines. Um, as I previously stated, most of the development is already platted. Um, however, portion of lot one, uh, which is going to be up here at the um, on the graphic, the upper left corner of that um, is, is uh, going to be lot one. A portion of that lot is unplatted. Um, there's also currently unplatted portions of um, along Moonlight Road, um, which I've already talked about, has is excluded from this um, application as well. Um, as Lot 1 of Moonlight Plaza First Plat on Main Street, uh, Lot 1 of Gardner National Bank right there at the corner, the intersection of Moonlight and Main Street, and then Lot 1 of the Quick Trip Store. Those are all excluded from this uh, application. Just some quick um, photographs of a development. Uh, I've taken basically from one spot, turn to the right and turn to the left, so you can get a kind of an idea of the current strip center there. Uh, with Price Chopper, um, more on the east end of development, and then kind of centrally located is going to be that multi-tenant uh, retail strip center. Uh, this is taken a little further over by the bank parking lot, and this is um, currently a vacant parcel adjacent to uh, 56 Highway or East Main Street um, that will at some point um, be um, developed but currently is vacant and then kind of in that far and that brick building is the Walgreens building for some uh, kind of uh, point setting for you. This, uh, this photograph is taken of the Strip Center just um, north of the Quick Trip uh, looking to the north and the east. So this is um, a copy of the future land use map from the comprehensive plan. Um, this is the, um, the graphic actually from the Main Street Corridor plan. Um, since, um, as you are aware, uh, earlier this year the city did adopt the, the Gardner uh, Main Street Corridor plan and incorporated that plan into the uh, City of Gardner comprehensive plan by reference. This development in its entirety is included in that study area and has identi been identified as a community mixed use on that map. Um, so um, the, this future land use map does supersede what is included within that study area on the uh, future land use map within the comprehensive plan since this land use map was incorporated by reference earlier this year. A 2018 amendment to the comprehensive plan describes a community mixed use, uh, future land use in part as quote, intended to provide retail and professional services for the everyday needs of the people residing or working in the community. Uses should be limited to those that meet the needs of residents such as, um, such as civic uses, grocery and retail stores, restaurants, hotels, professional services and entertainment venues, as well as office and medical commercial uses. The current use of the development with the, with the multi-tenant retail and the multiple out par parcel retail along with the big box grocery is consistent with the future land use description of the comprehensive plan. Uh, just kind of a quick uh, slide showing you all the uh, utilities um, around the area uh, with yellow and gas, red electric, blue water, green sanitary sewer, and the brown storm water. As you can see, the site is ripe with um, public infrastructure and any infill development and um, any redevelopment of site has adequate access to all utilities on site. <coughs> As part of the proposed site plan, uh, which we'll discuss later, um, improvements to US Highway, um, US 56 Highway, excuse me, is proposed. The highway improvements include pavement widening for right turn lanes from East Main Street into the development and would be included on public infrastructure or excuse me public improvement plans submitted to the city for review. As a state highway, any improvements and right-of-way dedication requires approval from the Kansas Department of Transportation. 
and dedication of right of way along East Main Street for highway improvements proposed is with this plat and it's highlighted with the red graphics there of that uh, right of way dedication. So, um, and plans have been submitted to KDOT uh, for review by the applicant. Um, at the time, at this time, it's as of tonight, KDOT has yet to pr approve the proposal. However, um, comments from KDOT are anticipated in early October. It's about a four week time frame. So they are looking at it and they'll be providing applicants, or excuse me, comments back to the city and to the applicant. Um, because of um, this proposed widening and KDOT's participation in the project, staff has stipulated on the final plat application as, um, for approval that prior to signing or recording of the plat, the applicant must submit to the city documentation that KDOT has approved all improvements that will be impacting Main Street. Um, so, as I previously stated, that there are portions of this final plat which are um, unplatted, and therefore those unplatted parcel, uh, the unplatted parcels, are subject to excise tax. Um, I calculated that uh, it's about uh, two hundred twenty-three thousand one hundred fifty-eight point one square feet of land that is unplatted. And with this final plat, they'll be subject to excise tax on that portion only. Um, any uh, currently uh, platted parcels would not be required to pay excise tax on. So the excise tax would be approximately $44,631.62, and that will be paid prior to the mayor signing an approved recordable plat. Staff finds that the preliminary and the final plat are consistent with the comprehensive plan and the lot size and block layout is consistent with the garden land development code. So staff recommendation on the preliminary plat, the staff is recommending the planning commission approve the uh, preliminary plat case PP 1804, a preliminary plat for Main Street uh, Market with those parcel IDs <laughs> located at the northwest corner of South Moonlight Road and East Main Street. A staff report dated September 25th, 2018 and a preliminary plat dated September 7th, 2018. Finding all applicable requirements have been met. Staff recommendation for the final plat is staff is recommending the Planning Commission approve the final plat case 1806, a final plat for Main Street Market with those same parcel IDs located at the northwest corner of South Moonlight Road and East Main Street, a staff report dated September 25th, 2018, and a final plat dated September 12th, with conditions recommended to the governing body to accept rights of way and easements. Uh, recommended motion for the preliminary plat uh, for the Planning Commission, and the recommended motion uh, for the final plat including the stipulations here stating that uh, first, prior to signing and recording of the final plat, the applicant shall provide to the city documentation from Kansas Department of Transportation approving the amount of right-of-way dedicated and proposed highway expansion. Uh, second stipulation, prior to the mayor signing an approval, approved recordable plat, the applicable excise tax shall be paid to the city. And number three, the construction plans for any utilities, infrastructure, or public facilities shall, be, shall meet all technical specifications and public improvement plans shall be submitted and approved prior to the release of plat for recording. And that's all I have on the plats. I will break now and let the Planning Commission um, have, um, let the applicant come up and talk um, about these cases and um, allow any questions that the commission may have of the applicant or staff. Thank you. Uh, does the applicant have a presentation on the preliminary and final plats? Good evening, Mr. Chair. Joel Riggs, 5000 Kansas Avenue, uh, Kansas City, Kansas, Associated Wholesale Grocers and Supermarket Developers. Um, I have nothing to add to the preliminary plat but then the final plat. We will obviously have some discussion with the site plan. Uh, as staff said, uh, we're in conformance and compliance. We have no objections to the staff report or the recommended motion. So we stand for questions if you have any, but obviously we will remain for the site plan. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Planning Commission discussion time. You want to have any comments, questions, or would like to discuss anything? Start on my right. I don't have any. I don't have any. No, no questions. 
Uh, hearing nothing, I would entertain a motion on this item. At the review of the application PP 1804, a preliminary plan for Main Street Market parcel IDs as listed on page six of the staff report, located at the northwest corner of South Moonlight Road and East Main Street. A staff report dated September 25th, 2018, and a preliminary plan dated September 7, 2018. The Planning Commission approves the application after finding all applicable requirements have been met. Second. I have a motion by Brady and a second by Bowden that after review of application PP-18-04, a preliminary plat for Main Street Market, parcel IDs CP-1400000-001, CP-6550000-001, CP-6540000-001C, CP-6540000-001A, CP 6550000 a CP six five five zero 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 space zero 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 one CF two two one four two four dash four zero two zero CF two two one four two four dash four zero zero nine CP three five five zero 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 space zero 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 one and CP nine nine zero 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 space zero zero four seven Located at the northwest corner of South Moonlight Road and East Main Street, U.S. Highway 56, a staff report dated September 25th, 2018, and a preliminary plat dated September 7th, 2018. The Planning Commission approves the application after finding all applicable requirements have been met. Any additional discussion? All in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 6 to 0. I would now entertain a motion on the final plat. I recommend after review application FP-18-06, a final plat for Main Street Marketplace, parcel IDs CP-1440000-0001, CP-6550000-0001, CP-6540000-001C, CP-6540000-001, CP-6540000-001A, CP six five five zero 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 space zero 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 one CF two two one four two four dash four zero two zero CF two two one four two four dash four zero zero nine CP three five five zero 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 space zero 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 one and CP nine nine Zero 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 space zero zero four seven, located at the northwest corner of South Moonlight Road and East Main Street, U.S. Highway fifty six. A staff report dated September twenty fifth, twenty eighteen, and a final plat dated September twelfth, twenty eighteen. The Planning Commission approves the application with the following conditions: Number one, prior to the signing and recording of the final plat, the applicant shall provide to the city documentation from the Kansas Department of Transportation (KDOT) approving the amount of right-of-way dedicated and proposed highway expansion. Number two, prior to the mayor signing an approved recordable plat, the applicable excise tax shall be paid to the city. Number three, the construction plans for any utilities, infrastructure, or public facilities shall meet all technical specifications and public improvement plans shall be submitted and approved prior to the release of the plat for recording. And it recommends the government by to accept dedication of right-of-way and easements. Second. Got a motion by Bowden and a second by Garden Hire that after review of application FP-18-06, the final plat for the Main Street Marketplace, parcel IDs CP-1440000-001, CP-6550000-001, CP-6550000-001, CP-6540000-001C, CP-6540000-001, CP-6540000-001A, CP six five five zero 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 space zero 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 one CF two two one four two four dash four zero two zero CF two two one four two four dash four zero zero nine CP three five five zero 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 space zero 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 one and CP nine nine zero 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 space zero zero four seven located at the northwest corner of South Moonlight Road and East Main Street U.S. Highway fifty six. The staff report dated September 25th, 2018, and a final plat dated September 12, 2018. The Planning Commission approves the application with the following conditions. One, prior to the signing and recording of the final plat, 
The applicant shall provide to the city documentation from the Kansas Department of Highway or Kansas Department of Transportation (KDOT) approving the amount of right of way dedicated and proposed highway expansion. Two, prior to the mayor signing an approved recordable plat, the applicable uh, excise tax shall be paid to the city. Three, the construction plans for any utilities, infrastructure, and public facilities shall meet all technical specifications and public improvement plans shall be submitted and approved prior to the release of the plat for recording and recommends the governing body accept dedication of right-of-way and easements. Any discussion? All in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries six to zero. Uh, can as site plan SP-18-05 consider site plan for an approximately 62,500 62, square foot retail grocery store. Price chopper. Staff presentation, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the Planning Commission. Um, now I'll be presenting item 1C, a uh, site plan for Price Chopper, case SP-18-05. So this um, application is for a new Price Chopper um, located at the west end of the lot, or excuse me, west end of development. Um, in front of you, um, I've got the three current lots that are applicable to this application. Um, highlighted there, so it's a large vacant, um, those large vacant parcels there um, adjacent to Lincoln Lane. And then over on the right side you can see, although kind of a skewed graphic a little bit, kind of the relative location of this uh, project uh, within the city. Um, just some quick points of reference photographs for you. Uh, this is a picture of the vacant lot taken from across Lincoln Lane. Uh, looking south, that far um, building down there, that brick building, that is the quick trip. And just another quick point of reference photograph is from the southwest corner um, at the termination of Shawnee Street looking back to the northeast. Uh, this is uh, the site here with all the utilities available and again just like I talked about with the final or excuse me the preliminary and final plats um, all the infrastructure is readily available for development on this particular site uh, the applicant will just need to bring it in um, and be able to connect and there's a little bit of ad additional infrastructure for utilities going to be within the lot to um, directly access that building. Just kind of some quick uh, point of reference on this before I jump right into the pro um, talk discussing the project. So um, a new price chopper store is proposed within the uh, Moonlight Plaza development and um, to be located at the west end of development adjacent to residential and commercial. Uh, the building is to be placed at the north end of the lot adjacent to Lincoln Lane and is proposed to be a 62,516 square foot store on 7.18 acres. Um, at the east end of the development there is an existing price chopper. Um, I estimate about 54,000 square feet in size. Um, I don't know if the applicant might want to maybe kind of adjust that number but that um, was the, I believe, the, about the size. Um, and it's staff's understanding that um, if this project is approved and um, once it's constructed that the existing price chopper will be um, repurposed um, and uh, reconditioned for multiple retail spaces to allow some new businesses to go into um, the development. Uh, the rear of the building uh, will be directly adjacent to Lincoln Lane with the front entry and the majority of the parking facing south. Um, also along the north elevation of the building, a loading dock and trash compactor is proposed, um, which both will be screened from Lincoln Lane and the residential uses um, by a wood composite cladding um, screening structure. The primary entrance into the store will face south and uh, be visible from um, Main Street. And, and the entrance into a walk-in health clinic um, are also proposed on the building and that um, entry into the health clinic will be on the east end of the building. Uh, the south elevation um, would include um, substantial amount of glass, metal canopies, uh, multiple building materials, and seating area for a cafe. 
the preliminary elevations that were in your packet um, for the store will include multiple signage, um, not only for the store, but for interior occupants not related to uh, retail grocery use, such as a bank or a coffee shop. Um, but as indicated in the staff report, um, those all signage is um, administrative and not subject to tonight's discussion. Um, there is an ex existing um, internal drive that runs north to south and it'll run adjacent to the east side of this lot. And that will provide, um, currently provides primary access into the development. And this drive will also provide as primary access into the grocery store lot. Um, with the applicant in, is proposing improvements to 56 Highway as part of this project. Um, an additional right-of-way is proposed to be dedicated on the final plat, which was um, actually just approved by you. Um, currently, Shawnee Street, which is at the um, southwest corner um, of the development or of the development and the site, and currently terminates at the west property line. The applicant is proposing to carry this street over um, along the south side of the parking lot, north side of Quick Trip, and connecting, um, making a connection to that um, internal northwest drive. Um, it should be noted that a photometric study um, was not included with the plan documents. Um, the applicant and staff um, discussed this and agreed to include as a condition of approval that prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant will submit a photometric study and a lighting plan meeting lighting standards and will be reviewed by staff. So the building proposed is to be a large commercial building type, as I stated, 62,516 square feet grocery store with an accessory drive-through on the east elevation for pharmacy needs. Uh, the primary material proposed are a combination of the light and dark buff colored concrete masonry, masonry, stucco, wood composite cladding, and brick. And the maximum height of the building is proposed to be 36 feet in height. The building complies with the Land Development Code with respect to massing, articulation, ornamentation, and proposed materials. All four sides of the building have complied with these standards, reducing visual impact by providing neighboring properties with four-sided architecture. However, the only building design standard which does not comply with the Land Development Code is regarding transparency requirements, which is outlined in detail in the staff report and discussed later in the presentation. Um, just before we jump into discussing um, the uh, some of the administrative adjustments that was um, outlined in the staff report, uh, just some other comments um, on the plan and some additional um, just to bring up those conditions of approval attached to it. Um, because this site is located within 1,000 linear feet of a designated bicycle route or trail, which is a, it's a 10-foot bike hike trail that goes along Moonlight Road, Bicycle parking is required. Table 9.5 of the Land Development Code states the quantity of bicycle parking is to be based on the minimum vehicular parking required for retail use, which in this case is 213 uh, parking spaces minimum for site as outlined in the staff report. And therefore, 10% would be requiring a minimum of 22 bicycle parking spaces. The applicant has provided a total of 10 bicycle parking, which is 12 short of that required by code. And therefore, staff has included a condition of approval that the site plan shall be revised to show a total of 22 parking spaces on site. Um, the applicant um, has proposed um, per um, fire require the requirements of the fire department um, additional fire hydrants and other you know fire suppression um, along Lincoln Lane and within the parking lot south of the primary entrance of the building. Um, however, Johnson County Fire District 1 did request additional hydrants at the southeast and southwest corners of the parking lot. The most current site plan um, included with the packet does not show those hydrants, um, although earlier versions of the plan did include them and we just wanted to ensure that we have made sure we have met the needs of the fire department. So staff did include as a condition of approval that fire hydrants are to be included on the public infrastructure plans at the time of build, building permit at those two locations at the south end of the lot. And those locations are outlined in the staff report. And finally, just kind of a point of note is that this site is located within one mile of New Century Air Center. Um, and once the easements and right-of-way dedication noted on the final plat have been accepted by governing body, um, the preliminary plat, the final plat, and the site plan will all be heard by the Johnson County Airport Commission and Johnson County Board of County Commissioners. 
Now, as part of the site plan um, application, uh, four administrative adjustments were requested by the applicant. Those administrative adjustments were adjustments to building design and standards, landscape design, um, required quantity of parking, and parking dimensions. And we'll just touch on those briefly for you. So the first um, deviation at the applicant has requested is a deviation to building design standard for large commercial building type, um, which, in th which was due to the operational requirements of the store. The land development code requires a minimum of 30% transparency along all street facing facades, and that transparency is to be located between two and six, or excuse me, two and eight feet above grade. Um, which helps create a, a building relationship with the public realm. In this case, the requirement is applicable along Lincoln Lane only, which is the north elevation of the building. The length of that building is 270 feet and therefore would require a minimum of a total of 486 square feet of the facade to provide transparency. Now understandably, the north end of this building is planned for operational needs of the store, such as food storage or refrigeration, and it's not intended for customer access or display. So if, uh, just to kind of show this graphic of the north elevation of the building. The land development code does allow applicants to request a deviation from transparency requirements by providing an alternative equal or better solution. In multiple meetings the applicant, with the applicant, staff suggested some alternatives such as enhanced landscaping, building materials simulating transparency, or seating along Lincoln Lane for pedestrians. Uh, the applicant um, stated that the alternative has been achieved by providing the multiple building materials, elements to screen the loading dock, and breaking up the facade. However, staff disagrees uh, because these building design standards are already required by the Land Development Code. So, Therefore, I mean, the Planning Commission, you have the authority to determine whether the applicant has complied with the equal or better alternative to transparency um, building standard. Staff did include a recommendation, um, a stipulation to approve this administrative adjustment request, provide the applicant revises the site plan to include enhanced building materials, enhanced landscaping, or pedestrian amenities. And this has been, like I said, this has been included as a condition of approval. The second deviation requested by the applicant was to landscape design. The applicant is requesting a deviation to certain landscape <coughs> design standards, which are to the parking area landscaping, open space landscaping, and buffer landscaping. Staff worked extensively with the applicant to ensure the landscape, design, landscape plan complied with either the minimum landscape standards outlined in the land development code or met the reductions uh, requested by this administrative adjustment request. The reduction in landscaping in this request are less than 10% of the quantity originally required by code. Staff is supportive of this request because there is no perceived impact on the adjacent property or the public realm. And this request does not deter from the intent of the design, uh, landscape design standard. The next deviation requested by the applicant is regards to uh, parking quantity. The proposed use um, for the parking is classified in the Land Development Code as general retail use. And a retail use of this size has a minimum parking ratio of four parking spaces per 1,000 square feet. Section 17.09.030A2 of the Gardner Land Development Code states minimum parking is calculated on the base rate of square footage of the service area considered the open considered open to the public or patrons or leasable floor area where that number is not readily available 85 percent of the gross floor area may be used again understandably in this case the service area of the store has not yet been finalized therefore we would calculate parking based on 85 percent of the square footage of the building. This figure was outlined in the staff report, but just to refresh for the public record, if the building is proposed to be 62,516 square feet in size, 85% of that area is 53,135.6 square feet. For a parking ratio of four, to one, four per 1,000, the minimum parking necessary for this site is 213 spaces. The code does state that no use shall provide no more than 20% more than the minimum parking required for the site unless documented evidence is provided. 
Therefore, the maximum parking allowed is 255 spaces without providing documented evidence. The applicant is proposing a total of 317 parking spaces, which is 62 over the maximum parking as stated in the code. This is the parking ratio of 5.07 per 1,000 square feet. Now, to exceed that maximum parking of 255, the applicant must have completed two items. One, they must have provided documented evidence of actual parking demand based on studies of similar uses in similar contexts. And second, provide mitigating techniques to minimize potential impacts of excessive parking that, that excess parking creates. Staff acknowledges that the Gardner Land Development Code requires a lower parking ratio for retail uses over 25,000 is less than that of mid-sized retailers. Generally, those larger retail establishments are in some form of a big box retail serving as an anchor in large developments, helping to attract patrons and typically in those, in those situations, shared parking is expected within the development. Now, while the applicant argued there in their attached letter um, regarding parking that the lower parking ratio is not applicable to a grocery store or supermarket use, this is understandable since the Land Development Code cannot provide parking standards for every conceivable use um, for retail. This is where the code has provided flexibility, relying on, relying on the applicant's expertise and industry standards to aid the Planning Commission and staff in this adjustment request. The applicant did provide documented evidence for the need for increased parking based on historical data in the industry, which was attached to the staff report. And to get a better understanding of what other cities did, staff researched other jurisdictions both within the Kansas City metro area and nationally and found that typical parking ratios for grocery and supermarket uses range from four to five spaces per thousand square feet. The applicant has also proposed to de dedicate 60 parking spaces for shared parking with Lot 2, which is going to be just south of that Shawnee Drive extension. Those spaces are highlighted in the graphic in front of you in blue, and it was also included as a graphic in your staff report. Now, although the request is greater than 10% allowed by an administrative adjustment, it is staff's opinion the applicant has complied with the requirements to exceed the maximum parking, and staff is supportive of this request because the increased parking should not have an impact on surrounding development. The final deviation requested by the applicant is regarding parking dimensions. So, the Land Development Code in Table 9.8 lays out several different types of parking dimensions and we looked at the 90, 90 degree angle parking dimension with a stall width at a parking angle of 90 degrees at 9.5 feet, a depth of 18.5 at 90 degrees, and a drive aisle width at 25. The applicant proposed the first seven to eight parking stalls um, of the aisles just south of the front entry to be 10 feet in width. This is the total, um, those first seven to eight parking stalls within those lanes equals the 78 total stalls, which is 25% of the overall proposed parking on site, to be 10 feet in width, which is a 5.2% increase. The depth of all on-site parking to be 20 uh, feet in depth, which is an 8.1 increase, and a drive aisle width of 27 feet, which is an increase of 8%. The applicant has requested a deviation to the parking dimensions to help alleviate conflict between vehicles, grocery carts, and pedestrians. The increased width of the parking stalls apply only to the first seven to eight parking stalls in each aisle in the lot south of the building, a first choice of parking for patrons. Staff has gone out to Moonlight Plaza uh, to measure the dimension of the parking stalls and width and dry and the width of the drive aisles and found that the size of the parking stalls and the drive aisles are inconsistent throughout the development. So you would have, this row would have this dimension, this row would have a completely different dimension, the next row would have a different dimension from the first two, and the drive aisle widths were also inconsistent in width throughout the development. It is staff's opinion the request does not create a significant impact on the surrounding area. The parking lot is screened from surrounding development, and the public um, from the surrounding development and the public realm with perimeter parking. Um, excuse me. <laughs> I'll start over. 
The parking lot is screened from surrounding development and the public realm with per parking, perimeter landscaping, existing buildings, buffer screening, or fencing. Because of these factors and due to the fact that the request is minimal, staff is supportive of this administrative adjustment. Staff findings. Staff um, finds that the plan does not fully comply with the land, Gardner Land Development Code. Those items which do not comply have been requested for an administrative adjustment or has been recommended um, as conditions of approval. And the gar staff finds that the plan is in compliance with the Gardner Comprehensive Plan with use. Staff is recommending approval of site plan case SP-18-05 for price chopper with conditions outlined in the following slide. And the recommended motion with recommended conditions of approval. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll now have presentation by the applicant. Good evening again, Joel Riggs, uh, 5000 Kansas Avenue, uh, Kansas City, Kansas, Associated Wholesale Grocers and Supermarket Developers. Um, let me give you guys a little bit of background just so you kind of are aware. Some of you know me, some of you don't. Um, I actually am a Gardner resident, uh, live in this community, have lived here for about 18 years, have developed Gardner, have been developing projects in Gardner since 2001, residential, non-residential, multifamily. Um, and, and this has been one of the hardest projects I've worked on in the 18 years that I've been coming to Gardner to develop real estate. And it's not because it's a complex project, it's because you have a complex code that is extremely difficult to interpret for developers. And it's easy for staff to interpret it, but we, we interpret things differently when we read them. But all this boils down to basically four items. And it really comes down to a grocery store that we would love to build on this property that is better than the grocery store you have today, to be honest. Has increased sales volume, sells more groceries, provides more opportunities for the customer, and quite honestly, one of the most beautiful buildings that Gardner will ever have. It'd be nicer than anything that's been built in Gardner in the past and anything that I've seen in Gardner coming. From the materials that we've selected, from the layout we've selected, we've been involved in this project for over two years. I personally have been planning this project with the retailer, the Costantino Group, um, for over two years and trying to make this project work. It's not easy. The project property is tight. There's very limited site access for anything additional, every bit of detention that you need, that you see and you normally see with a, a commercial development like this, is gonna be underground. That's extremely expensive. We also chose to make the building look beautiful on the building side that people are gonna look at, on the, the south side of the building. I don't see any need, not only do I not see any need, I don't see how it warrants having any glass on the north side of that building. We have racking, we have groceries, we have freezer space. I have forklifts that pick those things up and put them in the racks. I can't have glass at six and eight feet that we're gonna be busting through. Now, to offset that, we've spent a ton of money on increased landscape materials and additional building materials. Adding quick brick to match quick trip and the existing retail center that's out there. That was planned. That's not something that we just added because we wanted to, it was a mitigation for transparency on the north side of the building. The, the transparency, we had, a, we had a local general contractor look at the transparency requirements, um, and I've looked at the transparency requirements as it relates to national. AWG is a national wholesaler. We have 4,000 locations. I am the one guy that does development all over the country. So I've done stores in Breckenridge, Colorado. I've done stores in Dallas, Texas. I've done stores in Chicago. I've done stores in Florida, Atlanta. I've done stores in Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska. I've never seen a transparency requirement this high. It's, it's just not typical, especially for a grocery store. But with that said, transparency would have cost us on the north side of that building about $49,000. Instead, what we chose to do was increase the north elevation, so what people drive past and see, to the tune of $150,000, $113,000 quick brick that we've added. So going above and beyond is exactly what we're trying to do, adding quick brick to the back of a building, which is the back of a grocery store. Quite honestly, if you drive on, on Lincoln Lane today and see the back of our grocery store, you're probably not gonna love it, but it's the back of a grocery store. 
let's be honest, how many people on this planning commission drive down Lincoln Lane on a daily basis between Moonlight and the subdivision and look at that grocery store and go, my God, that's ugly. We need to do something as a planning commission to change that. I don't. And I drive in this community every single day. Pick my kids up from school here, take them to dance here, go to Dairy Queen here. So I've seen a lot of things come and go. We disagree holistically on the transparency. I do think that we have gone well above and beyond to add to the front of the building. And I can list 15 more things that our architect has done on the front of the building that isn't required by code, but we chose to do to mitigate the transparency and the landscaping that we found challenges with as part of this development code that you guys have adopted. We're not dismissing it at all. 100% not dismissing it. We are trying to add value to the project. But we're also trying to be conscious of a project that has a budget. And, and quite honestly, at the beginning of this project, we were so far above that budget and looking at the code, we had to do something differently. So we decided to come up with a different plan. Much of this has been done in conjunction with staff. Some of it has, some of it has not. But much of it has. I want you to realize that. The other item that we have a, a complete disagreement with staff on is, is parking. Um, I said, I mentioned we have roughly 4,000 stores ap across the country. Uh, we put parking in front of our buildings strategically. I'll, I'll start with the five to one ratio, um, which is not only a requirement that we have as a wholesaler if we're going to build a new grocery store, it's a requirement of the Costantino Group if they're going to sign a new lease. Parking is critical for the success of a retail business. Your development code does not address grocery stores in this respect, at least not in our opinion. Staff has to interpret, that's their job. We as developers have to interpret. What we've done to mitigate that is offset an additional easement and cross-access parking. Obviously, we want as many people in that grocery store to have parking as available as we can. The difference between the store that we have today and the store that we will be building, the store that we will be building is a standalone store. Right now, we have cross-access pit parking with Jeff Jacobs, the owner of the small retail center that has the Papa Murphy's and the Good Sense and all the, he's a different ownership. He's a totally separate owner from the Price Chopper entity. But we have an agreement where we can overflow parking onto his space if we need to. The existing Price Chopper has three and a half per thousand parking. John Costantino wrote a letter, it's provided in your packet, it's not enough to, to suffice for his business. So we are, we are very, very much in favor of the Planning Commission approving five to one parking. Let me address a little bit on the dimensions of the parking. And this is again, something that's very critical to us and it's something that we and staff just haven't agreed on. We put 10 foot parking stalls in the first third of our parking base. The reason why? Trucks. How many of you guys drive a truck? Easy to get in and out of a nine foot space? No. That's not required. That's not something that's code. That's something we do that we have noticed that our customers like. Walmart doesn't do it. They get as tight as they can. They get as many parking spaces as they can, as tight as they can. We feel that those premier parking spots for people with trucks, the elderly, and widening those drive lanes provide safety and assurance for people that are, that are coming into our parking lots. And quite honestly, it's something I can't believe others don't do, just as a matter of practice. Does it meet your land development code? No, it doesn't. I get that. But what did we do? We tried to mitigate that with what we were doing with parking easements. And lastly, this one just is, is baffling to me. This one just is, is baffling to me. Um, it's, it's actually something that really should, in my opinion, never even come up, but it, it does. 22 parking spaces for bicycles. I'm not building a high school. I don't want kids coming to my, high school, to my, my grocery store in a bike. I want them to come in a car where they can buy 10 bags of groceries and put them in their trunk. We're, we're in agreement that there's, there's a need for bicycle parking, but 22 spaces for bicycles, in my personal opinion, is, is just not something that is intelligent planning. 10 is overkill, which is what we're proposing. It's not a big cost issue. It's just, why have it? It's, it's throwing money out the door that, in our opinion, isn't needed. With all of that said, we do feel that with the administrative adjustments and the, the offsets and mitigations that we have proposed, we do meet your land development code. And we will provide one of the best looking buildings and the best projects Gardner has seen in the 18 years that I've lived in this community. 
And I've seen some good projects come and go in this community. I've been involved in some of the best ones. And I still believe wholeheartedly this is the best one I've been involved with since I've been in this community. Happy to answer any questions that you may have. I thank you for your time. Thank you. We'll now open it up for combined commission discussion. Uh, thank you. So if you have any questions, comments, discussion points, this is the time. We'll start on Marat. Um, as far as uh, the city agreed with the parking, uh, if the presentation was correct, um, I have no issue with your parking request. I, I, I feel that you provided enough uh, reasoning for it, and uh, I feel it's well thought out. Um, the landscaping, no issue. The transparency on the back, um, I know where you're coming from, but I'm also living Gardner, and I can tell you that probably the main way that I'm going to get to Price Harper, which I do shop at, is going to be Lincoln Lane. And right now, a lot of the people on the north side go down Moonlight and the Enterprise Chopper off Moonlight. And I foresee Lincoln Lane being uh, a more direct route, so you will have uh, increased traffic, in my opinion, on Lincoln Lane. Uh, also, I do drive past the old Price Chopper, and I, I don't like looking at the back of it. Um, I do appreciate on the transparency part that uh, you're making it look nice on that side, but I also think that's something that you should do on a, a street that's going to be driven more than you've indicated, in my opinion, up there. Um, you don't have to do the transparency part per the code. Um, I know the city mentioned adding a couple park benches uh, along the street. Uh, Landscaping, uh, I wouldn't think that that would be a huge cost to mitigate the transparency issue. Uh, let me reiterate one thing. I want to make sure I'm clear on this. Um, what we've done to mitigate the transparency on the north elevation is we have, in conjunction with staff's recommend or suggestions, we have done three things. We have added breaks ups of the facade, meaning pilasters on the back side of that building, north on the north elevation. So we have bump outs, if you will to break up the facade so it's not as massed. We've added quick brick, which is a building material that is double the cost of what normal building materials we would put on the back side of that building. And we've asked, also added the, the screen wall uh, with a wood composite material for the um, dumpster, the trash compactor, and the, and the dock. So I'm not saying we're not doing anything. But in addition to those three things I just mentioned, we've also added another $50,000 worth of cladding on the front of the building, more glass on the front of the building. So we're not skipping it. It's not a money issue. It's more of a principle where we feel we've complied and, and met that mitigation and offset holistically. We felt like we did that months ago, um, but we, we haven't come to an agreement. And that's where your code is subjective, quite honestly. It's, it's how it's interpreted for me and my design team versus your staff. And we've had a difference of opinion. I mean, there's just, there's no other way to say it. Um, however, like I said, at the end of the day, we didn't just say, no, we're not doing it. We, we tried to do what we felt was better. I'm spending more money on the back of that building today than what we were spending to begin with. And it's more expensive than glass. It's not the, the glass isn't the issue in my opinion. It's what we're doing to mitigate it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, for staff, what ability do we have on the bicycle parking spaces? Is there any ability to change that number or is that set? We'll take a look at that real quick, one moment. Okay. But while you're looking at that, I, I just have to say I, I'd be lucky if I found 22 bicycles at any given time mm -hmm. going down Moonlight. So um, I know it, it's part of the code, and I, we want to stay within the code, but I'd like to see, you know,
Commissioner Bowden. It would be considered a site design standard and the land development code allows an administrative adjustment of less than 10%. So we could reduce it. So that would be reduction of two. So the max that we could authorize is, uh, or the, the least amount we can authorize is 20 bicycle parking spaces, basically. Correct. I don't have any more comments right now. Okay. I guess my question is along the same lines with the bicycle. What would you be losing by putting in the extra 10, 8? What would you have to give up? Nothing. It's just physically, in my personal opinion and looking at this, ludicrous to have 20 bicycle spaces for a grocery store parking. If it was an elementary school, holistically agree I think the code needs to change I'm not saying that what the staff is, is recommending is right or wrong I just think your code needs to change to have a large building you're gonna get other large buildings I'm going to be developing other large buildings in this community most specifically the existing price chopper and if I have to come in and go through all of this again on the existing price chopper we're gonna have to rethink what we do and maybe it is a code amendment that takes place prior to us doing the price chopper there's a lot of things in your new code that just quite simply don't work for Gardner. And that's coming from a gentleman that spent 15 years on the Johnson County Planning Commission, a licensed professional engineer in the state of Kansas, and done millions of dollars of development all over the country. Your code needs revision. Um, I think that was my only question. Just random questions and comments. Uh, first one, and Joel, this is probably for you. Delivery trucks on the on the, uh, on the north side, Lincoln Lane is not a very wide street, blocking traffic, 18 wheelers. Uh, Commissioner Brady, what we've done is we've laid that out so it's backing, the trucks are backing into the, the, the loading dock and it's a single bay loading dock um, with a trash compactor option. The, the truck turning movements have been looked at, there's no issues, we will not block traffic. If we do, it's less than two minutes as they're turning in and backing into down the stalls. We're also providing a screen wall at that location to provide sound mitigation and visual mitigation. But we have looked at the truck turning templates and we are very comfortable with how it is. It's actually a better scenario than what the existing price chopper has. Okay. On a positive note, the con connectivity to Shawnee Street, that's, that's going to be great for yeah. our community. Uh, no brainer there. The other thing I wrote down, the bike racks, it's, it's ridiculous that we would have to require 22, 20. 10 would be uh, sufficient. Actually, five, five would probably be for sufficient. I mean, if you drive by Price Chopper, there might be one bike there uh, at any given time. So I, I don't know what kind of flexibility we have. It's it's just something I'm pointing out to the to the to the city as a whole that there's it's not just a bike rack. There's other things. I have no problem spending fourteen hundred dollars on a ton of ten space pipe bike rack. It's really the bigger nice. issue is the code is the issue. The old price chopper would be converted to retail space. The current owner of price chopper will now be the owner of that retail space. Would that be sold? The current owner of the price chopper is John Costantino's organization. Um, they're going to maintain ownership. As a third-party nonprofit developer, we are helping the Costantinos okay. with that project as well as the, the price chopper. And I did say not-for-profit. We are a non Supermarket developers, the developer of this project, is a nonprofit organization. The only thing we do is develop grocery stores for our member retailers across the United States. This is not a profit scenario for Associated Wholesale Grocers. Does the city have any requirements on that retail space that there has to be a commitment to the space for this project to go forward or anything like that? My fear is we're going to have some retail space. It's going to be sitting empty. Probably not in Gardner, but I want to ask the question anyway. Uh, Commissioner, it's, uh, it's our understanding that the owner of the facility is committed to redeveloping the space and uh, has a this project that you're looking at tonight is simply the first phase of three phases. The redevelopment is the second phase, and then there is a, uh, a third component, which is the redevelopment of the outside facades of the existing strip center area and with some, Joel, I believe, some improvements to the parking and lighting included to that. So we are we are in the understanding that they are committed to the complete project, sir. I can answer that question with this, and this is the easiest way I can answer it that makes it explainable. 
the financial models that have been created for this project assume the complete redevelopment of that center, including the existing price chopper and the existing retail strip center that's there today. So all financial analysis that's been done assumes that redevelopment. Is part of those three phases to build out to the east of the current price chopper? That eastern property to the east of existing price chopper is owned by Jeff Jacobs, not yeah, by the okay. Costantinos. It right. is a separate parcel that is not included as part of this application. Acquisition was attempted. It wasn't feasible. Okay. A couple of quick other things. The, the parking, when I read the report ahead of time before I came to the meeting, I, I, I saw that the parking was a little bit of a, a trip up. Um, with the counter proposal, is a, is a city staff in agreement that the counter proposal is sufficient? With the vehicular parking? Yes, yeah, staff is yes. supportive of that. Staff is supportive. The applicant okay. has complied with so make sure. providing um, documented evidence of their need. And staff has also researched, um, as I've stated, local, local municipalities as well as other municipalities nationwide. And they range, parking ratios range from four to five spaces per 1,000 square feet. So they're, they're right in target. Okay. And, and finally, finally the, the transparency that are on the north side. It's the, it's the back of a grocery store, people. But again, we did mitigate. I mean, the glass piece, I mean, really? But it faces, it faces a street, and that staff's challenge I, is their I, review. I get it. Again, I much like it. the bicycle racks, there's things that don't fit every box. And in this case, there's a few, four particular items that didn't fit in the box. Larry. Staff recognizes the concerns that council have and have worked with the applicant to try and mitigate those actions. Um, just like CVS, this is a similar situation. We had yes. CVS where CVS had actually three of its fronts face streets and the transparency requirements were on three sides of that facility. And as you well know, we worked through that and wound up just with the single face. In this case, the only one that's facing the street is Lincoln, is the, the side of the building that is the back of the store in this case. So it's not that we don't understand their, their desire to, to, they're not ignoring it. We recognize they're not ignoring it. Yes, they have worked with us to mitigate that. It's just staff's responsibility to bring to your attention that that is the side of the street that actually has the transparency requirement and therefore it needs to be addressed by plan. But we could recommend in our motion to waive the glass requirements and, and all that. Is, that. is that correct? There are options for you to take advantage of and that they can take advantage of to waive that, yes sir. And that is to do some of the things that they've already talked about doing. The add addition, uh, they've added uh, uh, plasters and the change in materials and so forth. Uh, it's 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 not that those aren't adequate. It's just that when you look at the design overall design of the facility, those are kind of maybe part and parcel of what you would expect to be there already. Uh, we grant that the quality of the materials may be enhanced so that they're spending more money to make them look better, and we we, we accept that. Um, we're just asking that the, account, the uh, planning commission take it into account and make a decision. If you accept it, you accept it. Ultimately, it would be our desire that the elevations that are submitted to staff and to the planning commission for review would be accepted. I, I always struggle about waiving rules because I think it's, it sets a dangerous precedent. But I also think part of our job is common sense. Um, I'll leave it at that. Okay. Just a couple of uh, points. First, uh, I want to go back to the bicycle issue for just a minute. Uh, taking Price Chopper out of, out of this specific scenario, in, as we develop the rest of this plat, because it will also be within a thousand feet, 
of the bicycle pass, are we going to require these kind of, uh, and I'll use the word, unreasonable bicycle parking requirements for every business coming to this plant? I mean, Your requirements the, are based on the size of the building. So as we, as we do future buildings, they're not going to be as big. They're going to be 3,500, 4,000 square feet. But, but, so providing four or five bicycle parking spaces in a in a restaurant or a sit not down, a big deal. it's not that big a deal. I, I simply I, I point this out as a bigger issue. issue. Yeah, we I have no issue with the fact that you're providing bicycle parking. That that in and of itself, with the money Gardner has invested in the trail system, the money that the developers pay into the system to build that park system up is substantial. So I'm in favor of that as a whole. Okay. It's just the total number for a grocery store being 22 was odd for is, me. Are, does that present any burden for you having 22 versus 10? It takes up space that we don't think is necessary and quite yeah. honestly would bring on liability that we're going to have to endure. But if there's nothing that can be done from a cost perspective, it's minimal. Okay. And, and then the next question will be just from a pure safety, you kind of alluded to that uh, with a lot of this coming across uh, Lincoln Lane, the access. If you start attracting that kind of bicycle traffic, is that presenting, in your mind, does that present any kind of safety risk? I don't think so. And we're actually providing a lot of additional sidewalks as requested by okay. staff along Lincoln Lane, which there are no sidewalks on the entire Lincoln Lane today, yet we're going to be building one. We're going to be building one down Shawnee. Um, so the, the opportunity, no, I, I'm not concerned. And, and it was mentioned that there's road right of way that's being looked at and, and required by KDOT. It's not mentioned. I don't believe it was mentioned. Okay. But there's also a traffic signal that we are proposing at the intersection of of what was the access private access between Walgreens and Quick Trip. Um, we're looking at a full fledged turn signal at that location. So we do think the improvements to what is the access lane now between Lincoln Lane and 56 Highway will be totally redeveloped. We actually proposed that originally as a public street. Um, but at the end of the day, it's going to be a private access, and it's going to have a turn signal at 56 Highway, and we will have improvements at Lincoln Lane as well. With, with i got two more issues I want to ask, just a couple of quick questions about. One is uh, on the transparency issue on the north side. Uh, what, out of the two or three scenarios that you proposed, uh, from the developer and price shopper's point of view, what is the most recent, what is the most, your preferred method of mitigation for that? Well, we proposed three total. And, and, and the plans three? that we provided to staff for review have all three in them today. Okay. So the plans that we've provided are what we are proposing to as mitigation and offset. And it's increased pilasters on the western end of that north elevation. Added, we added quick brick, which is a brick material. It's an eight inch brick that matches what Quick Trip was built out of. And it's similar to the brick that the, uh, the uh, existing retail center was built from. And we also did the, the wood cladding to per break up the visuals. So there's three different building materials that we're using and offsets that we're So proposing. you're good with that, with that design? Yes. And in addition to that, we added about $100,000 worth of increased building materials to the north side of the building. We added more glass than what was required, I'm sorry, to the south side of the building where the building is actually being seen from 56 Highway. Okay, and then for our staff, do you, are you supportive of that solution? Staff actually says substantial glass on the south elevation in their staff report, which is correct. The Planning Commission can make that determination if they feel that the applicant has met that equal or better standard. Okay. Uh, one last area, parking. Mm -hmm. uh, you are good with the, with the shared access on the south side of the lot? We weren't huge fans of it, but we know it's part of retail development, and it was an easy way to mitigate what we were doing. We were more concerned about losing five to one parking than we were the easement, so we agreed to it. And, and, you're, and we have authorization to approve the 10-foot stalls in the front? Okay, thank you. No further questions? Okay. <coughs> So I, I have a lot to say on this subject, but I probably won't say it all because this is recorded. So uh, as far as, let's just start with the parking stalls. Five to one is pretty typical. I'm surprised that our code doesn't allow um, for that or doesn't start at that location with buildings over a certain size. Um, as we grow and build more big box stores, this is going to be something that they are going to need. Um, so I'm not sure why. We have a four to one requirement. 
Um, truck turning was brought up earlier. Uh, it looks like they have it inset where the trucks are going to be turning on the east side of the building, not on the north side of the building. So there's north and east. Um, so well, there shouldn't be any obstruction on Lincoln per se because they're going to be turning around. It looks like they're going to head south and then turn back. That's to correct. The west. So yeah, that's correct. That that's that's what it looked like to me. Um, bike stalls. I don't know what to say other than what's already been said. <clears throat> I lived in Lawrence for a good chunk of my life. That's where I got my degree at KU. Biking town. I think I've seen four bikes at a grocery store. So I don't know why. Like we would have twenty two. Um, I I would at least suggest we have twenty because that's as far as we can go. And I understand that. I'm, I'm simply pointing it out as a potential opportunity. <laughs> or could we do nineteen point eight? <laughs> we have like a point eight. All right. Um, just I guess as a joke to bring up the levity. You tried to acquisition the land of the east. I know why you couldn't acquire it. <laughs> I mean, the, and they they value their land at, at like gold prices. Correct. So like if if you find gold, never mind. Okay. I will you, tell you, you that that same seller is who we're buying the land from. Right. So um, the transparency issue, I. I don't have a problem with this. So when I was reviewing for this before we started, and then I, have, I went ahead and opened this up, when I look at this and I see that this is the north side of the building, and I know that that's the back of the grocery store, I was like, holy crap, that's a nice back of a grocery store. Um, so it, it, it surprises me that this isn't above and beyond, that this doesn't meet the threshold of going above and beyond to mitigate transparency standards. We so, felt the same way. That, that's that's what I saw when I first looked at this, uh, preparing for today. <clears throat> so I, I guess I want to end with what we what we've heard from this one particular developer today is what I hear from a lot of developers about Cardinal, and it's something I've kind of been bringing up <clears throat> occasionally. But we have in my office we have two of the biggest land guys that sell land. They did 42 million in land sales last year. They have a lot of property in Gardner to sell, but they can't sell it to developers because developers don't want to deal with a lot of these small issues. So I bring it up, I guess, I don't know who's, what the issue is, but I know that developers continually say that there is an issue with Gardner's development code. So there's not one specific thing about it, and I don't know where the issue lies. So if you could maybe expand on what the issue is. Is it just a series of development it's codes? A it's a series of things. And, and I think, quite honestly, there's not enough flexibility. Staff is tied. Much like this bicycle rack thing, there's nothing you guys can do. I'll say in the old days, early 2000s, when I present to a planning commission, if you guys wanted to change something, you could. Quite honestly, right now you can't. Because it's a regulation versus a code. You have a book of regulations that you have to meet. And if you can't check that box, you have to ask for an administrative adjustment. And I won't go into great detail. I will tell you, I, I will happily volunteer to be on any type of board that looks at revising this code. Because I, I live in this community. I develop in this community. I just developed a single family subdivision in this community. My kids are staying in the school district. I, I love this area. I've been down here for 18 years. There's things that need to change. It's not a mass override, but there are some things that definitely need to change from a developer's perspective. From, an, from a resident's perspective, I love it down here. That's why I've lived here so long. So I guess that's kind of what I wanted to bring up. I just think that this, this sentiment is being reiterated throughout the development community. Um, and I was waiting to see a developer come in here with some frustrations because I've been saying this publicly um, and I think I brought it up on this board maybe one or two times in the past but there is there's some sort of disconnect between developers who see potential in Gardner but don't want to jump the hurdles I will say this to credit your, your staff they did not give up on us we had a lot of challenges we did find ways to get through this it's not easy but I, I don't blame them as much as I blame the code and the consultants that help get the code written. I think that's an important point here. Um, mm -hmm. 
I don't want our staff to feel beat up. I don't they're either. doing their job. Correct. They're, they're doing what they're supposed to be enforcing the codes that we all and the governing body have approved. Correct. So I think we need to keep that in perspective. I want to make sure right. that point uh, is clear. So going back to your point, how do we create change? I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, you know, maybe I don't know if that's with us, that's with the city council, different recommendations from our staff. I, I don't know. If no yeah, more questions I, for me, I'll sit down. Yeah, I, I do want to reiterate. I don't think it's the staff. I do think it's the code. That's what I constantly hear is that there are code things that happen that developers don't like and either have given up on projects or began the process and stopped. This And this is just what I'm hearing from my profession. So, Well, let me, let me just jump in because, um, you know, although I represent City of Gardner, or I represent lots of municipalities, um, the trend of these specific defined development standards and the increase over the past 20 years is not unique to Gardner. Um, it's, it's been ramping up in municipalities um, you know, all throughout Johnson County, Wyandotte County, um, on the Missouri side. That frustration that you heard has been a repeated frustration that's been repeated in many communities. Um, compared to 20 years ago where there was kind of carte blanche, you could kind of do what you wanted to. Um, but to that point, um, you know, this is your code. It's the planning commission that makes the recommendation. So if there's something you don't like about it, it's your job to initiate changes to it and recommend it to the governing body. Not to simply say, well, it's all bad and that's why no one's developed anything in Gardner. I mean, that, that's why you all are on this body, is to figure out what makes sense for development in your community and how to, how to push things forward so that um, if you're hearing frustration, if you've got frustration, um, you know, this is, this is your opportunity to voice it and do something about it. So, just a little broader perspective, because uh, I, I do um, work in many communities other than just this one, so. Thank you. Um, I guess I've got just a couple questions or notes and um, trying to figure out or remember what all I was going to say or ask. Uh, I, I agree in general with a lot of the stuff that was said tonight um, so far and uh, I think we can find a way way through this from the the only thing that kind of stuck out with me regarding the bicycle parking and and I'm not saying that you're ever going to have 20 bicycles there, but we keep saying this is a grocery store, and, and it is primarily, but if I read the information correctly, there's also a, a health clinic and a cafe and some other things uh, as a part of the facility, which don't require people to carry grocery bags with them when they leave. Um, the... the uh, Transparency issue, uh, I agree it doesn't make sense to put transparency uh, on the back of this building. I don't want your foreclose pushing through glass either. Uh, I also agree with Commissioner Bowden that it kind of drives me nuts to drive down Lincoln Lane uh, looking at the back of the existing price chopper and the other buildings there. Um, but what you have presented is much better looking than those existing structures so I appreciate that um, as far as whether uh, yeah I'll um, and one other question that I had for staff probably and I may have I don't know if I should have asked it before or not but the north northeast drive uh, from the lot seems to be awfully close to Lincoln Line. Is there any issue or concern with people turning right from Lincoln Lane and people exiting that drive being that close or does it meet our standards? 
Public Works reviewed that and they were satisfied with that separation of that drive from Lincoln Lane intersection. Okay. Additional questions, comments, thoughts, concerns? I think, uh, yeah, to your point, I, I think there is more discussion to be had, probably not during this agenda item, but in general. Uh, it, it concerns me somewhat to hear that we're still hearing the same things we were hearing before we revised the land development code and the intent of revising it was to make it easier on people to develop so um, but that can be a longer discussion at some other time uh, from what I'm hearing it sounds as though the board was was the board their commission thinking as far as the recommended motion do you want to talk through these uh, items five, before we one, actually make a motion? Uh, five, one, two, three, I have four, change to ten bicycle parking uh, spaces. I have five, uh, I would be in agreement with the recommendation coming from the, from, um, the supermarket developers. Um, and then I'm okay with six. Um, four, uh, we can only change it to 20, right? Correct. Correct. The code has to change for us to, to go. We have to go with the current code, and the 20 is the most we can take it down to. And and with respect to five, it's more of just leaving it off, right? Correct. In, in my opinion, leaving five off would be it. Does that accept what he's already done? If we leave yes. five off, we correct. might. Well, we might have to. Would we have to state? Would we have to state that we're? accepting the changes that the developer has made as mitigation for transparency? Um, well, by removing that stipulation number five, um, it's my opinion, and uh, somebody else might want to weigh in, but that means that you are um, supportive of the applicant's mitigation efforts for the transparency requirements by deleting that stipulation. Okay. So so that would be as, as depicted or as submitted to us, is that correct? That would be correct, yes. Okay. By deleting five. Correct. So if you want, the recommended motion would be with, the, with five recommended stipulations, and you would read one through four, skip five, and read six. I just had one more question on the bicycle thing. I wanted to see if I understand what we're really talking about here. We're, we can only go to 20 for at this point, is that correct? However, at a future planning commission meeting, we could have a text amendment to the code or propose a text amendment to the code to allow for something less than 20 in this situation. Is that, is that, that my understanding? And that should be retroactive. However, if I may make a suggestion at this point, because this is why I have my hand up with um, the stipulation for the number of bicycles is based upon the parking requirement, okay? And it's based on the parking requirement for new only. Of 10%, correct? Bear with me. So the number of spaces is part based upon the new parking spaces number that they have asked for, we have supported. And on the square footage of the building, okay? There's nothing that says the 20 spaces have to be in one spot. You asked the question earlier, will we require bicycle parking on the renovations of across the rest of the facility? And the answer to that question is no, because the parking spaces are already there. We're not adding parking spaces. No additional parking is required. However, you could spread those 20 spots across the whole facility. They wouldn't all have to be in front of that store. So if you wanted to put five in the middle, five at the far end, whatever, you the, the just the parking, the, the number of spaces could be spread across this because you've got one big project here. It doesn't all have to be in front of their store. So what you're saying is we could say, for example, uh, 
the developer is asking for a maximum of 10 bicycle spots, for example. We could say the, the, the balance of the 12 could be spread across other lots in the development, is that correct? That's what I'm suggesting to you, yes, sir. Thank you. That might be a solution. Will there have to be new bicycle parking spots across the rest of the development? In addition if there to are the existing required? spots out there that we are not aware of, and we're not requiring any new, I can check with staff to see if we would count those. And just so I can clarify one thing on that your statement, is that this is an example of one thing staff did to help with this standard. We didn't even base the number on their proposed number of parking. We based it on the minimum parking right. we were supposed to provide. So right. it's not their 60 extra spaces we counted in there. So you know the six spots. You know, we went right. by the minimum parking required for that use. Right. So, and so I guess the, the question, or another question that I have now is, so this site plan is only for this site. It doesn't include the rest of the platted area. So how can we tell them to put parking spaces somewhere else that's not on this site? It was just a recommendation for some way to spread the parking across that because the bicycle parking because it, the question had been asked earlier, were we going to require it? And the answer to that would be no, we're not. But if you wanted to, so suggest to them to do that, you could. So, so I, I just want to say that the best way to probably word that would be to have 20 spaces of which at least 10 are in front of the new or in, in lot two, is it? Is that what we're talking about? Lot one. Lot one. Lot one with the rest being spread out through the rest of the plot through other lots basically i would I, gonna, <clears throat> my thought would be that we just limit it to provide 20 spaces period they've heard our discussion tonight it's not showing up on the plan okay. that we're seeing correct Right. It just has to be put in somewhere, and then let staff decide where, if where they want to put it, would be an appropriate location. So you're saying that can be spread out through the entire plat? That's mm -hmm. what Larry seemed to be indicating. That doesn't mm -hmm. make sense to me, but I'm not a planning guy in my everyday life. <laughs> I suggest we don't micromanage where these go. Right. Well, that, that's what I'm saying. I, I think the more open we can get, and I like the idea of just saying 20 spaces and letting them figure it out. Because the, the more open we can be, because we say 10 here, 10 there, mm -hmm. uh, it just seems kind of weird to me. I agree. Commissioner Gordon Hire. So I have a question on that, though. In the redevelopment of the rest of the area, if they restripe, for more parking, is that considered new? Like if when they redevelop the old price chopper or that strip center, if they restripe and make it uniform, is that considered new parking? If they increase the amount of parking over what is currently present, that would be considered new parking. Okay. So that might add to your number anyway. So we on agreement for 20 bike spots using the administrative adjustment and uh, we agree on the parking adjustment uh, we agree on the alternative that you're moving five right on the facade so Sounds basically like we're saying this recommended motion without five and changing and 22 20 to 20. 20. and changing 22 that's what it sounds like to me yeah all right Okay. Any further discussion? If not, I'd entertain a motion. After review of case number SP-18-05, a site plan for Price Chopper, parcel ID CF-221424-4020, CF-221424-4020, 
4009 and CP 655-0000-0001, a site plan dated September 7, 2018, a landscape plan dated September 18, 2018, and a staff report dated September 25, 2018. The Planning Commission approves the application with the following conditions. One, prior to the issuance of a building permit, a final plat shall be approved by the Planning Commission with rights of way and easements accepted by the governing body. Excise tax shall be paid and the plat shall be filed and recorded with Johnson County. Two, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the application shall obtain approval from the Johnson County Board of Commissioners. Three, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall submit a photometric study and lighting plan meeting lighting standards and shall be reviewed and approved by staff. Four, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the site plan shall be revised to illustrate a total of 20 bicycle parking spaces as required by section 17.09.030E of the Garner Land Development Code. Five, the applicant shall include fire hydrants on the public infrastructure plans at the southwest and southeast corner of the lot as required by Johnson County Fire District 1. Second. I have a motion by uh, Commissioner Simmons Lee with a second by Bowden, or Commissioner Bowden, that after review of case number SP 18 05, a site plan for Price Chopper, parcel ID CF 221424 CF 2214424 4009, and CP 6550000 space 0001. The site plan dated September 7, 2018, the landscape plan dated September 18, 2018, and the staff report dated September 25, 2018. The Com Planning Commission approves the application with the following conditions. One, prior to the issuance of a building permit, a final plat shall be approved by the Planning Commission with rights of way and easements accepted by the governing body. Excise tax shall be paid and the plat shall be filed and recorded with Johnson County. Two, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the application uh, shall obtain approval from the Johnson County Board of Commissioners. Three, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall submit a photometric study and lighting plan meeting lighting standards and shall be reviewed and approved by staff. Four, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the site plan shall be revised to illustrate total of 20 bicycle parking spaces as required by section 17.09.030E of the Gardner Land Development Code. And five, the applicant shall include fire hydrants on the public infrastructure plans at the southwest and southeast corners of the lot as required by Johnson County Fire District 1. Any additional discussion? All in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries six to zero. Thank you to the applicant for your explanations. Thank you. Regular agenda item number two, comprehensive plan amendment. Hold a public hearing and consider a comprehensive plan amendment to the 2014 Gardner Comprehensive Plan, Chapter 12, Capital Improvements to update the chapter to reflect the current improvement plan. Staff presentation, please. Good evening, Chairman and Commissioners. My name is uh, Gans Garcia. I'm the Utilities Director. Uh, on July 25th, 2017, the Planning Commission initiated an amendment to add a capital improvement element, better known as CIE, to the Cedro Garner Comprehensive Plan. The CIE is a long-term plan for addressing the existing and projected needs for capital improvement for electric water, wastewater, recreation, transportation facilities, and services. The CIE addresses projects that are considered essential for maintaining existing service levels and anticipating new capacity requirements associated with pop population growth, development, and accession as embodied in the city's comprehensive plan and other master plans. The CIE contains schedule of anticipated phasing and costs in today's dollars for capital projects. These are the five-year schedule, the 10-year schedule, and the 10-year plus schedule. 
the five-year CIA schedule should be considered as a subset of the uh, city's five-year CIP. Uh, the city has recently completed updates to the transportation master plan that includes the airport and updated the CIE schedule for the period 2019-2048 to further support the CIE and provide a basis for obtaining funding. This update information should be incorporated as amended to the comprehensive plan. Uh, attach our draft changes to chapter 12. Deletions are shown with struck through and additions are shown underlined both in blue text. If Planning Commission adopts the attached resolution and forwards a recommendation to the governing body to approve the amendment, the next step will be to provide notice to the county and any townships affected up to 20 days prior to the action by the governing body. Uh, we have uh, two recommendations. Recommendation one, staff recommends the Planning Commission to adopt a resolution, resolution to amend the Garner Comprehensive Plan to include a revised Chapter 12 capital improvements element and forward a recommendation of approval to the governing body. And recommendation two, staff recommends that the Planning Commission initiates comprehensive plan amendments to incorporate the updated information from recent master plans and studies and to further strengthen the implementation plan. Thank you. <clears throat> this is a public hearing item, so we'll now open the public hearing. If anyone would like to comment on the item, please come forward and state your name and address for the public record. Individuals are allowed three minutes, and the individual representing a group is allowed seven minutes. Have anyone from the public wishing to speak? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Sorry. A motion by Commissioner Bowden with a second by Commissioner Brady to close the public hearing. All in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 All opposed. Motion carries six to zero. Public hearing is now closed. Planning Commission discussion. Anyone have any questions? No. no. I just have one. Uh, why was it? It's also on the first page. Why was it on? Uh, why was it changed from fifty thousand to twenty-five thousand? Is there a reason for that? Change to twenty-five thousand from fifty thousand. Says. Uh, Capital improvement is defined as land, non-structural improvements to land structures, including the cost of design, permitting, construction, furnishings, and equipment, technology, and facilities with a unit cost of, and then the change to 25000 or more. Because the, uh, the CIP has a threshold of 25000 So in order to be uh, aligned to the CIP, it was lowered to 25000 I don't know if there was something we were trying to accomplish with that. Yes, to make it similar to the CIP. I have no questions. Uh, there are no other questions from the commission. I would entertain a motion on this item. Oh, I'm sorry. Can I ask another question? Absolutely. So I'm not understanding what the main difference is between the two recommendations. What, why, which would you lean and why? I'll have to have somebody from staff We're supposed to make both motions, correct? Or are we supposed to pick one? I'll jump in here. One of them is to approve the revisions to Chapter 12. And then the other one is to initiate um, amendments to the plan to incorporate by reference um, recently approved master plans and studies. So we've had a couple um, Uh, the transportation master plan has been updated, so we want to make sure that we reference that in the comprehensive plan. I think it's in chapter one or two that all of the other plans are referenced. So we want to make sure we're referencing <coughs> the most current plans. 
So the first amendment, or the first recommendation is to approve this amendment. And then the second uh, recommendation is to just incorporate those new plans into the comprehensive plan okay. at a future date. Yeah, I thought it was an either or. And I'm like, nope, hey, no. not an either I mean, or. I feel like one of these is leaving out something. We would ask that you do both of them. Thank you. And just for those listening along at home, the uh, slide presented is not what we're talking about right now. That's the next item. Any additional questions? Entertain a motion. Move to adopt a resolution to amend the Gardner Conference's plan to include a revised Chapter 12 capital improvements element and for a recommendation of approval to the governing body. Second. I have a motion by Brady with a second by Garden Hire that we adopt the Planning Commission adopt a resolution to amend the Gardner Comprehensive Plan to include a revised Chapter 12 capture capital improvements element and forward a recommendation of approval to the governing body. Any additional discussion? All in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries six to zero. I move now, to initiate the conference of plan amendments to incorporate the updated information from the recent master plans and studies and further strengthen the implementation plan. Second. The motion by Brady and a second by McNear to initiate comprehensive plan amendments to incorporate the updated information from recent master plans and studies and to further strengthen the implementation plan. All in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries six to zero. Thank you. Thank you. Regular agenda item number three, text amendments. 3A, TA-18-10, hold a pub public hearing and consider a proposed text amendment and zoning map amendment to create a Gardner Lake Overlay District. We're going to do these one at a time, I assume? Or, okay. So we'll do that one first. Okay, good evening, Commissioners. Kelly Drake Woodward, uh, Chief Planner. Um, so tonight we're going to hold public hearings and take action on two text amendments. And just so you're not confused after that, we have some discussion items on potential text amendments. Uh, some reason it's not advancing. Okay. Here we go. Uh, the first one is TA 1810 nonconforming lots. This was initiated by the Planning Commission at the July meeting to modify provisions pertaining to nonconforming lots to address immediate development issues for properties near Gardner Lake and similar issues that might arise citywide. At the August meeting, you determined a two-fold approach was indicated, a short-term approach to amend the non-conforming lot standards to allow certain combinations of non-conforming lots, and a long-term approach to create a district to address specific context of the residential area around Gardner Lake. This would happen with future comprehensive plan and land development code amendments. So the immediate issue, uh, which I think uh, you probably understand, we talked about them at a couple different meetings now, um, but that you cannot create new lots or combine lots that do not meet current development standards. And the current development standards don't address the narrow lots out at Gardner Lake. Um, this situation is prohibiting the combining of lots to accommodate building additions or improvements um, under the city jurisdiction and results in de-annexation or could result in that. I think we did um, invite the impacted lot owner. Um, they're not here tonight, but, but we did invite them. Okay, so the intent of this um, relatively simple uh, text amendment is to allow those non-conforming lots to continue. Um, and those are laws that were platted legally prior to the adoption or amendment of the Land Development Code in August of 2016 that cannot be platted under current standards. Um, so we would allow them to continue um, or to be brought into conformance as reasonably practical, but um, we 
the intent of these standards is to balance those interests of those property owners in their past investments, um, not expand any non-conforming situation or make it worse, and promote investment that's consistent with the comprehensive plan and land development code. So the comprehensive plan does designate the Gardner Lake area for low density residential use, and so um, this amendment furthers the intent of the LDC for non-conforming lots and would enable them to initiate typical residential improvements. Um, this is the text in red is the new proposed language with this change. Um, they would be able to combine non-conforming lots as long as they don't increase the degree of any non-conformity. Any newly combined lot that is non-compliant with current standards will still be deemed a legal non-conforming lot with those associated rights. Anyone wishing to build a new structure on one of the non-conforming lots would be able to do so as long as the structure is compliant to current standards. And a property owner would be able to rehabilitate or expand a non-conforming structure as long as it doesn't increase the degree of non-conformity complies with all other requirements of the code. Those last two things that pertain to new structures or rehabilitating structures are different standards in our code, but I'm just telling you that so you know the whole context. So we would ask that you hold a public hearing on this text amendment. Thank you. So this is a public hearing item. So we will now open the public hearing. If anyone would like to get a comment on this item, please come forward and state your name and address for the public record. Individuals are allotted three minutes and an individual representative group is allotted seven minutes. Are there any members of the public wishing to speak? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Second. I have a motion by Commissioner McNair with a second by Commissioner Brady to close the public hearing. All in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries six to zero. Planning Commission discussion. This planning Commission discussion. Anyone have any comments, questions, or would like to discuss anything? Star, am I right? Do not. No. That's no. Good. I have some discussion issues, or not issues, questions. I, um, um, I like seeing someone else because that used to be me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm Everybody I'm says no. And then I would be at the end saying, oh, yeah, I've got like 18 things. <laughs> it makes um, me happy. It, <laughs> when you combine two non-conforming lots, it doesn't seem like there's any limiting principle to not combining two non-conforming plots. I don't see how you could have two non-conforming plots create more non-conformance, if that makes any sense. Two negatives equal positive. Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. Like, I don't, I don't understand... Like, is there is there a way to combine two non-conforming plots and get worse compliance or conforming? Well, that's an interesting question. I'm trying to think of an example. I mean, don't get me wrong. I like it because it's basically saying, yeah, you can conform to non-conforming lots. I mean, our standards are basically just minimum lot sizes. So right. possibly so, not. So I'm saying if, if our standard is, if, our, if the limiting principle here is the lot size is the issue, combining two non-conforming lot sizes can't possibly get you closer to less conforming. But it's not just talking about combinations. It's also alterations. Oh, OK. So if somebody wanted to subdivide or split or something. OK. OK. I like it then, because that way you can basically combine two and that's kind of what we're going for here. Um, the, the other part is when they rebuild or when they build a new structure on, two com on new newly conformed lots, if they still don't meet the building code or like let's say, you know, setbacks, they don't meet the setback requirements now as is and they combine with another lot that would not get them to setback requirements regardless, are you saying then that they can't build with those two lots combined? I'm saying they can't make that non-conforming setback worse. They oh, can okay. build so, on, okay. but not that so, side. So they, they don't meet the setback requirements. They, they added on this other lot, and they're still at that same setback. They're 
So combining a lot would do you absolutely no good if that makes any sense. So you couldn't be able to build or expand or do anything on that that lot because acquiring it doesn't meet our code. There's no the boundaries are so tight that the setbacks you couldn't expand on it anyway. That's not something that's unique to your code. I mean, it, right, right. Lots of municipalities have this. Where, you know, for example, you'll have a another municipality I had had a had an old kind of utility narrow lot that was vacated, um, and somebody acquired it. They couldn't. It was non-buildable. They just acquired it for green space. Um, that I mean, that happens. And with the kind of hanky. <laughs> Well, hey, the Gardner Lake was platted. I mean, that's just that's kind of the reality out there. Okay. We don't anticipate that right now that any of the lots that are in the city are non-buildable at Gardner Lake. But okay. And I was, and I, I remember when we had this discussion back then, we were looking at future-proofing it in case any lot or something wants to, we can make this a part of any future acquisition that Gardner may have around that lake. For any annexation, so. We're, um, if I understand your question correctly, we still have to address the long-term issues a different way. Okay. Okay. But this does address the issue that was currently brought up. Mm -hmm. like, and the the resident who was supposed to attend, it does fix that issue, though. Right. Okay. That's it. Okay. Okay. I'll entertain a motion on this item. I'll make a motion that we go with the recommendation on page three of item 3A as printed in our staff report. Uh, I second. I second. I'm going to say I second. Okay. We'll have to read it all. Got a, a uh, motion by Commissioner Brady with a second by Commissioner Gardenhire that the Planning Commission, after review of findings and staff reports dated July 24, 2018 and August 28, 2018, after holding a public hearing on September 25, 2018, recommends that the governing body adopt TA-18-10, amending, amending section 17.01.060 nonconformances and specifically subsection E of the Guardian, of the GMC Title 17 Gardner Land Development Code to read as written in this staff report presented at the September 25th Planning Commission meeting. Any additional discussion? All in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries six to zero. <clears throat> Regular agenda item number three B, text amendment TA-18-05. Hold a public hearing and consider a proposed text amendment pertaining to a planned district <coughs> near the I-35 interchange. Staff presentation, please. Thank you, Commissioners. This topic was initiated by City Council on February 5th, 2018, and first discussed at the April 2018 Planning, Com Planning Commission meeting. The understanding of Council direction is that the I-35 intersections are a unique opportunity and gateway to the community deserving additional protections, and a, that we need potential zoning and mechanisms with the goal to set aside some property for a mix of uses as an alternative to large single-use developments. Um, if area of particular concern is areas near I-35 where development is more visible and introduces an impression of the community. Um, we obtained direction from you <coughs> all um, in a series of discussion questions, <coughs> and you un unanimously expressed a number of concerns um, which we translated into policy direction that you would feel comfortable with regulations that accomplish the following. Encourage development and annexations into Gardner along with the accompanying tax revenues. Do not result in parcels remaining vacant if a mandated use is not in demand. Are flexible enough to not prompt excessive requests <coughs> for deviations or exceptions and offer the opportunity to support a beneficial but anticipated development type, or in other words, don't be overly prescriptive ahead of time. 
So we discussed a new approach um, at the August meeting um, with a specific regulatory approach that we thought could achieve the goals of the sub-area plans and the governing body and address uh, your direction. Um, the activity center district is an optional district that's tied to development incentives that will require city council direction and action. Uh, the regulations are relatively unprescribed and flexible, intentionally somewhat subjective as a plan district. Remember, um, what we were dealing with tonight with Price Chopper was not a plan district, much less subjective in our standards regarding a non-plan district. Um, and this would encourage but not mandate a mix of regional and community serving uses and um, uses, uh, it uses our current plan development process and procedures and review criteria so we don't have to reinvent all that, offers the opportunity for deviations without sacrificing core principles expressed in our sub-area plans. So what if a developer chooses not to use this optional district? They can rezone to a base zoning district like CP2, like Price Chopper did, or C3. C3, heavy commercial, et cetera. They could rezone to a general plan district um, like CP3, CP2 like CBS. Um, they, those both are approved by planning commission and the governing body. Neither provides a clear link to achieving a mix of uses. That's why we're talking about this alternative. So the intent um, you reviewed these last month. I don't think you suggested any changes or concerns with the intent. So basically uh, is to address that desired mix of uses, support multimodal transportation, support an enhanced public realm along the gateway areas, and provide for compatibility between uses. So this time I overlaid the, that half mile area from the interchange uh, property onto the future land use map so that you could kind of see which land uses and which areas could potentially be addressed with this optional plan district. Um, the uses for this district are based on the typically applicable zoning districts associated with these future land uses on this map. So the, the, this is from the comprehensive plan future land use map the land development code translates those future land uses into optional zoning districts that people can choose to be consistent with those land uses. There are several zoning districts per each of these future land uses that are possible. They have with them permitted uses. So I, I gave you an attachment with um, the uses that could possibly happen in the two um, future land use areas we're trying to promote, which is the community mixed use or community commercial future land uses. So th these provisions that we will be talking about must be met if the applicant wants to rezone to that district and to take advantage of whatever incentives the council puts in place. So this is just a restatement of what I just said about the permitted uses, what you how you determine them. It's whatever typically applicable zoning district is associated with what's on that future land use map with exceptions. And those exceptions are within that half mile, those circle areas. Um, those need to be consistent with community mixed use or community commercial future land uses. Those translate to, to office, neighborhood business, or general um, business, general commercial zoning districts. And that, that can be a primary or a secondary component. Those uses have to be visibly prominent as viewed from I-35 and those applicable frontage streets um, providing a transition to more intense uses. And if those uses are not to be developed immediately or to be reserved for future development, then there would be deed restrictions implemented to ensure future compliance. We did have some discussion about this um, at the last meeting. Um, the development standards, um, we also had a discussion about this, and as stated, they are intentionally subjective 
except that what I was trying to do is just say where we're not going to allow as much deviation. We still want to make sure that we have those, that uh, internal circulation that's well connected. Um, we still want to provide those open and civic space types and enhanced spaces along the arterial and collector streets. We still want to make sure we have enhanced design also on those arterial and collector streets and that we have compatible height transitions um, you can vary from frontage type standards as long as the buildings that front those arterial and collector streets use that enhanced landscape design that's, pr that's required in our code. And also landscaping next to less intense uses is still maintained, those buffers that we have in there for a reason. Although they, they only require a buffer if, you know, you have a change in intensity between those uses, they may not be considered a change of intensity just because they're different uses. Depends on what they are. And then you can vary from the site and landscape standards provided that, um, oh, we just talked about that one, so. Um, and I did, I think I did revise one of those, but I'll point that out when we get to the recommended motion. And then amenities, this is just basically to try to encourage uh, some of the things that we call out in the sub-area plans that we want to have happen in this area, uh, like public transit, pedestrian and non-motorized access and circulation. I think that's the one I changed the language for. Um, and then other things like public art or wayfinding signs, et cetera, that the developer may be willing to incorporate. So I recommend that you hold a public hearing and then recommend approval of this amendment to the governing body, creating this entire new section for the Activity Center Plan District. Thank you. This is a public hearing item, so we will now open the public hearing. If anyone would like to comment on this item, please come forward and state your name and address for the public record. Individuals are allotted three minutes. Individual representing a group is allotted seven minutes. Seeing no one, I would entertain a motion to close the public hearing. So, so moved. I have a motion by Commissioner Bowden with a second by Commissioner McNair to close the public hearing. All in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries six to zero. Public hearing is now closed. Commission discussion. Start on my right. I spent a lot of time thinking about this one, and basically what I came to in the end is that it does provide it's 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 different, um, but I think it does provide options, and that was one of our issues uh, months ago was was options for that area, and so. Um, I think the plan is fine as it is because of that. So. Okay. I don't have any comments. I concur. Good plan. I just got one thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just think that uh, I, I like I like where this is at, only because I think it's it's an attempt. I don't think it's going to be perfect. These, there's always humps whenever something like this happens. But there's an attempt to balance between um, options and where we have strict code that we have to follow. So I think trying to find that balance is going to be fun. Um, so that's all i got to say. Okay. So looking at this just to make sure that I'm perfectly clear on what we're doing. So we would be creating a new AC-P, an activity center plan district. So that's something that could be applied anywhere, but we're not, are we specifically applying it to these areas? I guess we are. Well, that's a good and question no because it's it's an overlay, or it's not an overlay. It's, overlay. it's just a, a a specific planned district that can be used for specific 
reasons. I'm not saying that somebody couldn't use it outside of that area. I don't see why they couldn't, but I don't know why they would either. Uh, the, the property would still have to go through a regular rezoning to this district. So basically you're creating a new district. So if it's, you know, most of that land over there is ag, so it had, they'd have to elect to, to be rezoned to this this AC plan district versus, you know, I assume they would still have all the other options of just doing a traditional development, um, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that wouldn't be our preference, I don't think, but that, well, I mean, it depends that, that, on where those it options is. are available yeah. to them under our code. Right. And, and I do see where it, it limits this to being applied within a half mile of the interchanges, so that's, that makes sense to me. Are the, and maybe I should just ask or stop asking questions about it. I, <clears throat> I don't understand the purpose because we don't really provide any specific deviations from our normal standards, if I'm reading this correctly. Unless I'm missing something. Well, for plan districts, they can ask for deviations from almost anything, normally, a general plan district. This one says you can still do that. You can ask for deviations from the standards, except for the things that are mentioned. <laughs> so we're giving them an option to do a plan district that's more restrictive than if they just did a plan district with something else? That's correct. But it's tied to the incentives, is the idea. But you're, I mean, this community has not um, historically done planned districts. I mean, you've done general Euclidean districts, which apply site design standards to them. I mean, like the rezoning tonight was to what? It was a rezone, but yeah. No, it was just C2. It was, was just a, a C2. It's just a base zoning district. Yeah, it's, it was just to a C2. If they had, interesting enough, if they had de developed it as a planned district, although that gives you more control um, in dictating what's on site, it would have allowed them to vary all the stuff they didn't like. Right? True, but it takes longer and they have to have a public hearing. Right. So. But, but there, there's a mechanism, had they wanted to use it, to get away from the specific uh, strictures of the, the, the general design standards that they could have employed, that they didn't elect to use. Right. And that, I, get, I understand that. I, I don't know why anyone would, the way it's currently written, and, and I'll get, get to it here in a second. The way it's written, I don't know why anyone would choose to use this rather than another plan district where they don't have those restrictions. If the, so is the intent that we create this special zoning district and then the council can apply financial incentives just to that zoning district? And so we have to have a zoning district before they can put out an incentives package? Is that why we're doing this? There's not a yes or no answer to that. <laughs> the, the intent of the creation of this district was started at the city council in order to restrict all the property within a half mile of one of these two intersections from being all of one thing. For example, warehouse. Right. They didn't feel that that particular use or any one particular use of all one thing within a half mile of these intersections was an appropriate front door aspect of the community. In an effort to modulate those uses so that you had some variance or mixed uses, their intent was to create something that would make it appealable to the developer to use this district, which is where the incentives come in. So there has yet to be an incentive list developed 
for this district that goes with what the action is that you're taking tonight, which is to create it. The activity level hopefully would be such that those coming in probably wouldn't control all the land to begin with, but they could. And if they did, then they would probably want to make a mixed use out of it using a planned district. But this gives them an alternative. And I'm assuming that the incentives that we have yet to develop would make the district palatable for them to use. Okay. Sorry, that's the best I can come up with at the moment. So. That was good. <laughs> that makes sense. I understand. Um, yeah. Chairman Austin. Yes, sir. Um, you know, the city council was looking for one thing, and as you remember, because you were on the board at that time, mm -hmm. we did not necessarily agree with the city council. So uh, that caused this. I don't know if you want to call it compromise, but looking at different ways to do it. And in essence, we're coming up with this plant district, but then the ball goes back to the city council as to whether they want to support this uh, plant district by giving incentives to get what they were looking to get. Right. Is the way I see it. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Any additional questions, comments? If not, I'd entertain a motion. I recommend, after review of findings, the staff report dated April 24, 2018, and September 25th, 2018, after holding a public hearing on September 25th, 2018, recommends that the governing body adopt TA-18-05, creating a new section 17.06.040, AC-P, Dash activity center plan district of the LDC is proposed in the September 25th, 2018 staff report. Second. We've got a motion by Commissioner Bowden with a second by Commissioner McNear that the planning commission, after review of findings and staff reports dated April 24th, 2018 and September 25th, 2018, after holding a public hearing on September 25th, 2018, Recommends that the governing body adopt TA-18-05, creating a new section 17.06.040, AC-P, Activity Center Plan District of the Land Development Code, as proposed in the September 25, 2018 staff report. Any additional discussion? All in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 6 to 0. Kelly, is there any opposition to, from your standpoint, to table discussion item 1A to our, to our next meeting. I was just going to say we still have three items. 1A is one that needs to be carefully considered and discussed extensively probably. 1B, street trees, probably takes a little less time. But the most pressing item we have is actually input on the parklet right, because we need to start to building it. So you could defer whichever items you want and I, make, I want to make whatever, to make a motion on your agenda change if you'd like to. Requires a motion, I assume. No? Probably not. It's just discussion item. Okay. I don't know. That's the so the, <laughs> so, so the chair, the chair can, I mean, if you want to move agenda items around, if you want to take the parklet up first, recognizing you have a restricted time, the chair has the authority to set the agenda and move, move uh, items around. If there's a, a desire to table an item, that motion can be made and voted on. Um, those are all options. Uh, so the, the motion to table would be made by a member of the body. Um, but the, as I mentioned, the chair has the authority to set the agenda. Excellent. I would uh, like to move the parklet discussion up ahead of the text amendment discussions in lieu of, or in, because we're short on time. So discussion item, parklet survey results and in design input. Great. Good. 
Okay, uh, so tonight I'm asking you to review the compiled results and analysis for the 2018 Gardner Parklet Public Preference Survey. Consider those topics of discussion and provide di design input. And we have to, we have one month to build this, so we're, we're moving forward. Um, it is notable that Gardner is one of 129 communities across the nation that got an, a grant from the AARP Community Challenge. I need to recognize them and appreciate them for uh, giving this, this opportunity. Um, as you probably already aware, we're using it to create a pop-up mini park or parklet, all one word, um, as a place to rest or socialize. It's a sidewalk extension that repurposes vehicle space as a place for people. But it, the most important thing is it's part of our overall plan to create those permanent civic spaces north of City Hall. This creates that awareness and gets people used to using it for something besides a parking lot. Uh, the city will install and manage this as a mobile public park. It will be designed to move to other locations and events and maybe even to businesses or somebody else that wants to use it in the future. Uh, this all started kind of with the idea that temporary livability projects can lead to permanent change. Um, Jane Jacobs um, in The Death and Life of Great American Cities mentioned this in 1961. Um, about the importance of creating these pedestrian friendly conditions and placing less priority on the automobile. This slide shows that um, pedestrian friendly people oriented place that we hope to have someday uh, with city in the bottom right corner. Uh, the letter D is a church expansion. We took into you know consideration that they wanted to expand into their property there. Um, so anyway, we're trying to create social activity and walkability. And this whole idea of turning parking places into public spaces started in San Francisco on parking day in 2005. They just paid the parking fee, rolled out the carpet, put a tree down and bench, and that's, that was parking day. It grew from there um, into this whole international thing, tactical urbanism, um, do-it-yourself urbanism, guerrilla urbanism, uh, where People who want to change things and want to help people visualize it just go out there and change those public spaces short term, uh, trying to catalyze that long term change. That's what we're trying to do here. The parklet is intended to be located in this parking lot here behind the building um, in those parallel spaces on the north side, which is actually in the right of way. We did discuss it with the library, they've been great supporting this. So uh, we're moving forward. Okay, as far as the survey, I hope you all took it. Maybe you're already familiar with it. Um, we had 542 responses. Unbelievable. It was amazing. Um, we did have help promoting it from the library also and from our communications uh, professional in the city. So these are the top four activities with the stars that people said they wanted to achieve in the parklet. I think just from its basic design, it's, it's going to probably achieve that. Being able to socialize with others, that means you've got to have some groupings, seating that accommodates groupings of people and not just separations of people. Um, food and drink, probably need some tables for people to put stuff on so they don't spill things. Listening to musicians, our idea was that some of these uh, furnishings in the parklet could be taken out of there to make room for musicians or moved around to make room for mus musicians. Um, and definitely we need some shade because the back of the parklet is going to face south. The front of the parklet will face the street and the <coughs> sidewalk. So, you know, the sun's going to be coming towards the back of the parklet. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. Let's just recognize that we have these activities um, that we want to accommodate and we'll talk about amenities later here. But um, these are potential amenities that people noted uh, were important to them. Top ranked, shade, canopy or roof comfortable seating, lighting, tables, landscaping, and planters. Those are 
pretty much in most parklets that I've ever seen, except for maybe the shade and the lighting. The other items were of lesser importance, but maybe could be easily incorporated. So I think um, also reserve discussing this further um, when we look at the furnishings, but just to let you know, some other things people did mention uh, were drinking and hand washing water source or a decorative fountain, a lending library or book exchange, although the library is right next door, um, food cart, source of electricity, accommodation for the arts, games or activities, waste facilities, and ADA accommodations. Absolutely, we are going to have ADA accommodations. Um, and other things depends on our budget. You know, we have $22,000 to spend, so we haven't come up with that final budget yet in the material list, so we're working on that. Okay, uh, this was a question on layouts, and I've included them in order of favorites. And the, this was a weighted average question, so um, this was a top rated design. I think what our observations are about this after reading all the comments is what people like is it's a pretty picture of a nice looking downtown, it's beautiful materials, beautiful plants, it, it's very attractive. A lot of people said, you know, it's not real practical, we want more seatings, we want to change this or that, but it's really pretty. So we're thinking, trying to get this aesthetic somehow is probably good, but maybe the layout could be a little different. Um, one thing to note also is uh, some people noted that some of them, you know, were raised above the curb or not. This one is flush, so you can roll up on it. That that will happen. There all is going to be um, constructed so that you will be able to roll direct from the sidewalk onto the parklet. So you don't have to worry about that. No matter what layout, we will be able to do that. Um, so I don't know how much time we want to spend on going through each of these, but I'll just point out some of the uh, main features that people talk about in association with these other, you know, this is the second favorite one. Um, they said that the portable furniture would probably be damaged or stolen. I think that I agree, you know, with that. Um, and I'm not going to mention anything on ADA because, like I said, we're going to fix it you know, so that that'll work. But the number of divisions or dividers kind of felt like crowding. Also, I'm not going to mention comfortable seating because they all said we need comfortable seating. We know that. Um, and we all said we need cover or shade, so I won't mention that again either. But um, I think mostly people thought this was kind of junky or crowded and, and that the portable stuff wasn't going to work. Um, this one, um, again, they thought it looked a little bit crowded, or some people did. Um, some people were concerned with safety with the sharp angles. Um, but they liked it that there was spaces for both group seating and then just private individuals. Uh, this one, most people had aesthetic concerns with this. It was just boring, looked like a bus stop wasn't very good for socializing or grouping, uh, needs tables, countertops. Uh, this one, I, I was surprised this one was ranked five of six. I thought it would rate a little better, but um, <coughs> they thought it was kind of blocked and crowded and maybe there was a safety concern with that um, high countertop. I mean, people could hide behind there. Uh, and the tall seats don't work for people who are in wheelchairs, you know, or, or mobility challenged even some, sometimes, so. And then this one was the least favorite. Safety concerns, potential liability, especially for children climbing on that stuff. Um, seating takes up too much space and limits other activities and amenities and not good for group gatherings were things that were mentioned. Okay, so we tried to kind of put that all together to put before you something to think about. We didn't have much time. So you have to be creative in your brain. This, the stuff you see in wood grain is meant to be 
perimeter benches around the edge. And then the wood grain in the center is meant to be a back-to-back -back bench, so facing opposite directions. Um, so the space to your left that's defined in that 5x5 five five area is maybe enough space for as many as eight people, is what my guy tells me. Three on each bench and then two on the back bench. You've got the plants there. Uh, no table, just a group gathering space right there. In the middle, or kind of the, the rest of the parklet, I guess, um, we have the on the right-hand side a similar space, a little bit smaller, but it flows into this space with a table, a bench, and two kind of like cube uh, seating things that could be moved around. And I'll show you pictures of those, what that looks like. Um, I think he's thinking, uh, and I'm talking about our staff that's going to help construct this thing, that the table and the long bench would be tied together. The other two could be removed, so you could wheel, have a wheelchair go up to that table and use that table, and, and you could take those cubes and put them somewhere else to, to use them to sit on. I don't know if they disappear, but that's the idea. And the other idea is that that um, two-sided bench that's in the middle there will not be, it will be heavy, but it will be able to be slid away so that you could clear that space for performers or whatever. So it won't be permanently attached, but it can be moved. The lines on the, the bottom are indicating the flooring, which is going to be built in, I think, five sections. They're like six by seven, so that it all comes apart. The, the back part that um, the perimeter benches, I'll show you pictures, but they sort of overlap the, the bottom framework and then provide the, the back of the parklet. Um, let's look at some examples. Okay, the bottom left photo. That's all perimeter benches with the table with benches added. That's kind of similar to the right-hand side of the layout we just saw previously. Um, it's also kind of similar. Well, the table above in the top left photo is similar to what we envisioned, except maybe a little wider. Um, let's see. Let's see. These were some of the other pictures in the photo. See the cubes in the bottom right photo? Something kind of like that would be like those half cubes you could move around to sit at the table. Um, a lot of people, I think, liked that top right photo on this page just because of the natural wood look. You know, this seems like the wood is a popular aesthetic. Some people mention they like adding the color or the public art at the base of the benches. That's also a possibility. There's an example of some public art on the base of the benches or just an accent color. So these, these are like the top 12 furnishings that were come out of the survey. Um, I, I didn't put all of them in there, I just put the top 12 in here to just kind of give you an idea of what people responded positively to. Um, the top left photo, like that was nice and open, gave you some privacy. They like the material, the layout, the functionality, simplicity, uh, multiple areas for group discussions. Um, you can sit or stand have a group or one-on-one. -on -one. They suggested we need some backrest so that you serve more people. On the top right photo, things that people liked is the combination of the plants with the seating, material and the layout, versatile seating, that it felt relaxing and inviting, um, the separated seating areas, landscaping, raised tables. Uh, oops. Bottom left, the things they liked about it, um, it doesn't match up, sorry. 
There you go. Bottom left on this page. <clears throat> they liked the uh, partition as semi-block, the street view, uh, the combination of the benches and tables. They thought it was a little awkward working face-to-face -face with someone else. Some, one person did. Um, some people didn't like the flooring. Again, you can sit or stand, I guess. And then the bottom right, uh, some people like the chalkboards, but they thought that would be an opportunity for negative comments and tables and chairs would disappear. So anyway, we can continue, the, you know, I think you get the idea maybe of what people were saying and you probably had the time to look at the survey uh, results. So just moving forward, this is uh, Mike Flickinger, our, uh, our code reviewer, kind of drew up some stuff to give you an example of what we think those platforms are going to look like that would be the base of the parklet. So the idea here was we want to be able to move it around on a trailer in sections. So uh, I think they were thinking of putting some little caster wheels on one end and a handle so you could just pull them onto the trailer. Oops. Um, here's what he was thinking as far as benches, although after talking with um, a group here before this meeting, they said, okay, well, maybe don't make the benches so high. We, want, we don't want to feel so closed in. We might want to be able to see out a little better. Um, the top right, it's hard to see, but it's the table with the, the benches and cubes. It looks pretty much like some of the other ideas that you've seen in the pictures. So I guess uh, we would like your input on this layout that we were kind of thinking might make everybody happy. Not everybody, but hopefully most people. Or any changes you might suggest from like starting point here. Um, yeah, I have a question. Uh, maybe I'm missing something here, but to, to this incorporating kind of shade, that seemed to be pretty high on the list mm -hmm. for, the, for the requirements. And maybe I'm missing something here, but can you help us understand that? Well, we're not addressing it in this question in the survey. There's a, another question in the survey addressed the shade. But okay. if we were to incorporate shade in this, which we intend to do, um, we've been looking at some different options and I can show you the pictures of those, but we're kind of thinking maybe uh, the supports would be removable, they would be on the edges and, and the, the back side. We would maybe have some solar canopies um, that would attach and we'll show you what those look like. Um, so you have a lot of flexibility. We, you know, we have a budget, but that's the only real limit, so. Thank you. I feel that, you know, considering all the, the comments that were made, uh, I think it basically fulfills what a lot of people are asking for. It, you're not going to make everyone happy, but you do have a nice separate area where you can have a little group get together, and then you have a larger area where you can do more and and you can make those kind of small areas depending on how you do the bench mm -hmm. and the cubes. Of course, from my background, I'm always concerned about theft. Mm -hmm. And uh, anything that can be moved will be moved. <laughs> and it may not be moved where you want it to be moved. Right. Um, so I, I don't know. Is it if you take care of that, about the only two ways you can take care of that is make it so heavy that it's really hard to move or tie it down, which then also defeats part of the purpose of what you're trying to get there. So, I mean, I guess that's something that you have to be willing to take the risk or, mm -hmm. or do whatever you can to try to mitigate that. Um, but I, I do like the general uh, outlay here. Yeah, one of the one of the things I like a lot about it is the table and the benches and the kind of promote activities and if you want to play games or checkers or chess or something like that, uh, in a park, that's something you could do very easily. That supports that, and I like that, that feature a lot. 
there was an idea in the previous group's discussion about having built-in game boards painted on the table for what you're suggesting. Yeah, so. That'd be a great idea. Yeah, they like the idea too, so uh, that would be easy. Did you say that long bench moves as well? I think, um, I mean, it moves so you can move it somewhere else, but I think for some reason he had planned for the bench and the table to be combined uh, or stationary, but if you think that needs to be different, we can change that. No, I was just yeah. asking. For yeah. Yeah, the, the table and long bench are basically supposed to be one single unit, and so the, the other two small ones are supposed to be the movable side for wheelchair access, uh, and we could actually maybe even only do one of those two and then leave one open all the time uh, for ADA wheelchair access. Um, it's feasible to do that. That's one of the examples on one of the other pictures has, has it that way already set up as an example. Kerry, I think you've done a great job putting all this information together. I know it took a lot, a lot of time to compile all that data. Um, I'd love to see the library expand their Wi-Fi so if you're in this area, you could access the library Wi-Fi. I think that'd be very attractive to people. Would, would our Wi-Fi work out there? Or even the cities. Do you have, it does. Do you have Wi-Fi here? It does. Mm -hmm. We have a public Wi-Fi, but I don't know if the limit is allowed to check with IT. I just think that's, that is really of interest to people to have free Wi-Fi in, in a space like this. Front. I don't know how far back. Yeah. And then I don't see trash, a trash receptacle here. Maybe that's in the plan, but I noticed that was mentioned a couple times in the survey. And right. I think that's going to be really important. Other than that, mm -hmm. yeah, it, it, they will come. We're, we're thinking also bicycle parking. To, you know, like on the edges. <laughs> 20, 20, for 22 20, bikes. Not 20, <laughs> 20 of them. But, but you know, the, some of those negative, other plans had where they kind of did where the bikes go in on the outside. Yeah. yeah. Which I thought I like it was a good use too. of space uh, mm -hmm. by doing that. And then you could have a portable trash can that goes with it as opposed to being built into the parklet, I believe. Mm -hmm. How many spots does this take up? Does it say anywhere? Two. Okay. Mm -hmm. I might not say. And, Sorry. Well, I do have to ask, so, and I hope I don't lose too much popularity points, um, <laughs> the, the location that was selected is a parking lot that is often filled beyond capacity and is right across the street from an actual park. What was the reasoning? <clears throat> for well, it's not that? across the street from an actual park. It's just vacant land of the church. Is it a block of? Okay. I apologize. It's a, it's a um, but, park. but usually, I think who parks there are city hall employees with big trucks. I told them they're just going to have to park in the angle parking across the street, which is not usually all taken up. Well, but to, just to be clear, usually when it's all taken up, it's court nights, which when we get our new justice center, those people will be parking somewhere else. So I know it's been very full when I've been here during the day. It's pretty full tonight, and there's nobody here. Um, I just, I, I'll, I'll go ahead and say things. We, we realize that it's not an ideal location, but when we had to find a site initially to submit, for the grant application, we had to have an approved site that was allowed. So the library was kind enough to allow us to use that site. So we initially want to set it up there, work the bugs out of it, and then try and make it available to be used in other locations. For example, it can be used during the Gardner Fair, brought over to the fairgrounds and set up over there. Uh, it could go out to Celebration Park for some of our events and be used as a judging stand or other types of activities may even be a private business might want to use it temporarily at their location like over at Ground House or someplace like that. So we realize it's it's not the ideal location to get started, but it is the best spot we had to put it up, set it up, make sure it functions properly and kind of work the bugs out of it. The one thing, that, one negative comment we did get a lot of was you're not going to put it in front of City Hall are you on that busy highway? because they were really worried about the safety considerations for that. And so 
that is not where we'll put it initially. I, I doubt seriously that it'll ever wind up on a major highway, but. I mean, I did look at putting it, it on the did look wide that, sidewalk in front of City yeah. Hall, but it's noisy. The other thing we thought is that um, there's probably some security cameras that could maybe help keep an eye on it and there's a lot of we need to have eyes on the parklet so that people don't think they can get away with vandalism as much as possible and the key was that i wanted to use it to create the awareness for those new civic spaces so we have to put it wherever they're going to be so that kind of limited where we could go So, so we're generally good with this layout, do you think? All right. I'm, I'm fine with it. The only thing I will say is it's only, it takes up two spaces, but only if you orient it to spaces that are sideways. Yes, right. parallel spaces. Because if we were to, say, put it in front of the ground house, it would take up like four spaces. Well, uh, ground house has some parallel spaces on the north side of their building, so it would take mm -hmm. up two of those. Yeah, but then, then we're going to have to I know, yeah. We could maybe put four sections together in a cube, uh, you know, and then. Uh, yeah, otherwise, um, incorporating furnishings. You have any other comments on the, the types of furnishings or amenities that you'd like to see included? Let's see. I think I need to go to. Oh, let's look at the shade. Well, I was going to say with regards to furnishings. Okay. I don't know what type of wood you plan on using, but I would suggest cedar. Um, only because I don't like the idea of treated lumber. I hate the way it looks, to be honest. That's just my opinion. I hate the way treated lumber looks. I think they were thinking about wood or the composite yeah. decking stuff. Okay. Does, does composite fit within the budget? I don't know yet. That's, that's a good question. That stuff's that's pretty expensive. expensive. That's pretty expensive. Yeah. And right. I will say about composite, it has to be reinforced pretty heavily. Um, you get quite a bit of bowing when you use composite if you don't have a lot of trusses. I hate working with composite too. I'm a woodworking snob, sorry. That's what I do for fun. Nice, you wanna help build it? <laughs> I don't mind, I'll help. Okay. So you feel like you got enough info? I think so, unless you guys want to tell me anything else, I'd gladly take more suggestion. I will say that I think it was picture number, it was number three, I think in the survey it was 17 or something, I don't know. But it was the third one on that list. The layout or the furnishings? The furnishings, I think. Okay. So that sidewall, I think, would be a pretty good, not the color, I don't like the colors. That one right there, number three. Uh-huh. Um, I don't like the colors, but that sidewall could be also part of a shade. Yeah, area, which I, I agree, like. yeah. Yeah. But also, too, a canopy over that or something. Mm -hmm. The wind can go through it because it's slow. Mm -hmm. But you had other shade options, though. Yeah. Have we gone over those shade options? No, they are. I only um, really provided four options in the survey, and it was mostly to see: Do you want a solid roof? Do you want partial open, partial uh, solid roof, umbrellas, or a solar shade? And for some reason, the solar shade came in last, which I was surprised. Uh, there are other kinds of solar shades you can utilize. So we've seen some that were like shaped in triangles and you can multi-layer them. I've heard they're kind of expensive, but I don't know. Is that picture still up on the computer there, Michelle? Yeah, those, those look nice, but I'm telling you, Mother Nature will fade yeah. those and they'll crack, they'll peel, they'll slash. I mean, they just, they just don't last. And I think, um, I can't get this to go back now, but 
So the solid roof, people just didn't like the looks of it, but some of them have used more like a, a uh, what do you call it, portico or, uh, so it's like open slat design roof. Right. I was going to say, that would go well with, uh, with the side walls. Not a portico, no. what is it called? Pergola. Pergola, there you go. yeah. Yeah, is so. it meant, is the shed, is the roof meant to protect from elements? Well, that's a, that's a good question. <laughs> Definitely people want shade. Um, our, our guys were kind of concerned if you had a, a solid um, solar shade, like kind of this one kind of looks solid in this picture, um, that it might be, oh, the wind might tear it up more. You know, they thought if you had the open mesh ones, the wind could flow through, they'd be less likely to get damaged. Mm -hmm. People probably aren't gonna sit out there in the rain can you anyway, go back to picture? Um, Depends on what kind of roof. On the right. Yeah, can you uh, get it to go back? I can get it to go back. But that, that was what I wanted to make a comment on. Uh, that looks like just regular, what they call shade cloth or solar yeah, shade cloth. Yeah. That's relatively inexpensive. Is it? Yes, it is. And uh, if it wore out after a couple of years, you can, you can just reskin it. It's it, you can buy it in bulk. It's, it's pretty inexpensive. Okay, maybe but, the other stuff in, is a different material. It can also come in various densities from like 40% to 95%. Okay, shade and, and cloth, you shade said. Shade cloth. Just Google it on the internet and you'll find it. Uh, and, and they can custom make panels. It's not very expensive. Okay. Uh, could be a real good way to add some shade and, and, and not really increase the cost a whole lot. If you uh, know of a source, even especially locally, be, feel free to email me. and That would be helpful. But I did like to look at that and, and the functionality as well. It really kind of keeps the cost down. Mm -hmm. Well, we want to still be able to look into it um, so that we can make sure, you know, the activities that are going on there are good. <laughs> no problems. Um, but but we do want it to give people shade so they'll feel like being there. Any other suggestions on the shade? We'll see what we can come up with and probably send you out a material list and, and an idea of the final design and if you guys can help locate any of the materials or get people to donate any of the materials, that would be helpful too. Anything else on the parklet? Nice job. Thanks. <laughs> It'd be nice to find an Eagle Scout who's looking for a project. I agree. Mm -hmm. You know any? Send them my way. <laughs> I'll talk to them. I agree with that. Thank you. Uh, since we only have a few minutes left before our hard stop deadline, Seems to me like maybe we would want to table our text amendment discussion items. If others are so inclined, I would entertain a motion. To I'd make a motion that we table text discussion. Second. Got a, got a motion by McNear with a second by Garden Hire that we table text amendments A and B discussion items. All in favor, please indicate by, or in, do we need to set a date or just table? Or How about right back one? to the next meeting? Right. The next meeting. Okay. Okay. Uh, all in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries six to zero. One final word that I have before we leave tonight. I Obviously, there's nobody here this evening, but if anybody watches the recording, I would encourage any of our interested public to bring those comments and questions and thoughts to our staff members. And um, if you have any issues or concerns with our planning documents, uh, let us know. Because if you don't let us know, then we don't know we need to change anything. So, with that, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second.
a motion by Bowden with a second by McNear that we adjourn. All in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries six to zero. Meeting is adjourned.